my name is Olivia Lanes, and I am an educator and a researcher at IBM Quantum. 40 years ago today, right here at MIT Endicott House, there was the Physics of Computation Conference, which was jointly hosted by IBM and MIT. Today, I am joining you from that exact same venue, which hosted famous scientists such as Richard Feynman, Charlie Bennett, and Freeman Dyson, just to name a few. However, at that time, none of these people were doing quantum computing or quantum information as their day job. This was simply a side project for all of these people, and not even one that everybody took seriously. As is the case with many historical events, the significance of what was going on was not necessarily envisioned by the participants at the current time. For them, it was just a fun opportunity to get together to discuss some pretty far out ideas with their friends and colleagues and try not to damage the historical property. For at the time, in the framework of computing, quantum mechanics was sort of pushed aside and thought of as a nuisance. However, 40 years later, we now see the conference as one of the birthplaces of the fields of quantum information processing and quantum computing. After the conference, the field began to progress rapidly. It began with the BB84 protocol, which was invented by Broussard and Bennett in 1984. Shortly after that, in the 90s, Shor came up with the Shor algorithm. And then shortly after that, several proposals for quantum computing architectures and hardware which could actually implement these ideas were discovered and proposed, such as superconducting qubits, ions, and atoms, just to name a few. Today, we can access quantum computers from anywhere in the world, on the cloud, as long as you have an internet connection. Every few months, it seems, there's a new groundbreaking paper that we all have to stay on top of. The progress and interest in quantum computing has, over the past decade or so, seemed to grow as rapidly as the Hilbert space that it employs. I, much like the conference attendees, didn't necessarily see myself doing quantum computing as a career. I learned about quantum mechanics in college, and I made the very rookie mistake of thinking that I understood it. And today, many still see quantum mechanics as perhaps the most impenetrable of all concepts in science. Nevertheless, today we will hear from world-renowned experts in the field who will explain that despite its conceptual difficulty, it is still nevertheless incredibly useful and one of the most well-tested descriptions that we have of nature. Today we stand on the shoulders of these giants who not only set into motion this field, but been a catalyst for its remarkable progress over these past four decades. We will be joined this morning by Susanna Glickman, a historian and a PhD candidate at Columbia University, who will talk to us about the historical context of the discoveries made at the time and give us some more insight into the background of what led up to these events. We will have three keynote panels from Charlie Bennett, Peter Shore, and Steve Gervin, who will discuss the discoveries that they made. We will have a panel discussion from world-renowned experts in the field who will talk about the discoveries that led up to the present moment where we sit currently in the field and where they would like to see the field progress in the next four decades. In the afternoon, we will have a more traditional academic style conference that will celebrate the recent work that has been made in the field and highlight where we hope to go from there. We will also be joined by Jerry Chow, who's the director of hardware at IBM Quantum, Dario Gill, the senior vice president and director of IBM Research, and Jay Gambetta, the VP of IBM Quantum. We hope that today will serve as a celebration of the event that occurred 40 years ago, keep us motivated for the next 40 years, and help inspire the next generation of scientific leaders in the fields of quantum information. I'm Susanna Glickman, a fifth year PhD student in Columbia's history department working on uh, the history of, of uh, quantum information and computing. The Physics of Computation conference emerged out of major debates in the fields of both physics and computation in the late 1970s. In 1965, Gordon Moore proposed Moore's Law, which represents the relationship between time and advancement in computing, capturing the phenomenal pace at which computer technology has developed in the past half century. This theory sparked a debate around the limits of computation. Many at the big computing companies feared that silicon would have near-term limits. 
IBM's forecasters in the 1980s, for example, were pessimistic that silicon transistors could be miniaturized enough to extend Moore's law much further. IBM and Rolf Landauer in particular were paying lots of attention to this topic, especially with respect to heat dissipation and energy costs as these computers became ever larger and, and more powerful, these became more uh, important issues. Landauer firmly believed that computing could be done with significantly less energy than was popularly believed at the time. Figures like Caltech professor Carver Mead and Intel founder Robert Noyce disputed this claim and endorsed the view that Moore's law would continue unabated. This also coincided with a debate in the computing community about whether distributed or concentrated computing systems would fare better. IBM and other similar organizations favored centralized computing, which more closely resembled previously successful forms of industrial organization. However, Mead, Feynman, and others thought that personal computing would be more efficient. The triumph of the personal computing model led to the civilianization of computing and microelectronics starting about the, the mid-1960s. Personal computing and the explosion of the semiconductor industry induced large-scale changes in the way American science was organized, funded, and practiced. Those changes dismantled relationships among universities, corporations, and the U.S. government that were established in the early Cold War and are sort of colloquially known as the, the, the Cold War triple helix. In their place, public-private partnerships and institutional experimentation became much more common. And the basic research burden shifted from corporations like Bell Labs and IBM to government and government-funded academics. The concerns about the limits of computation and the much longer standing debates in physics about the second law of thermodynamics and whether it could be violated fascinated Landauer. He discovered that information loss is released into the surrounding environment as heat by studying these debates. This work fed concerns that information released as heat would melt silicon chips, especially as those chips got smaller and more densely packed, following trends predicted by Moore's law. These results likewise pr prompted Landauer, together with Charles Bennett, who you'll hear from in a minute, um, to begin thinking about reversible computation, which would avoid the heat dissipation problem and the energy consumption problem. Bennett then wrote his now famous reversible computation paper, which he presented at this, the, the 1981 Endicott conference, which we are commemorating today. Um, Bennett discovered that if you viewed computation in a different way, but, but not a quantum way, that there is no fundamental lower limit on the amount of energy needed for computation. This promise hooked several other researchers elsewhere in the world on the thought that they could potentially do computation with no energy costs and that this could revolutionize chip design. The Endicott Conference also captured much longer traditions and debates in physics about the very nature of reality. These types of foundational questions motivated participation in the conference from cosmologists, thermodynamicists, and all sorts of other people, and later in the fields which emerged from this conference. The conference and the fields which followed provided a site of exchange and potential resolution for several of the central unresolved questions about the worldview and metaphysics posed by major figures in the 20th century. The fields which emerged from this conference helped unify, or at the very least, table the divergent metaphysical statements about the nature of the physical universe which follow. Ralph Landauer's proposition that information is physical, Richard Feynman's assertion that everything is quantum, John Wheeler's statement, it from bit, which is basically about information being primary and physics secondary, uh, Bell's EPR experiments, and to some extent, the Copenhagen ever dispute about what quantum mechanics really means. The physics of computation and later quantum computing and information were closely connected to the fundamental debates at the heart of physics. Practitioners each felt that it supported their often contrasting views about the correct interpretation of physics. For example, Ed Fredkin thought that reversible computing might prove that the universe is in fact a classical computer. David Deutsch thought it might prove the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. David Merman, on the other hand, felt it bolstered the Copenhagen interpretation. Uh, similarly, many of the early experimentalists like Yasunobu Nakamura were building quantum computers without realizing it in order to prove concepts from quantum mechanical theory. And Fredkin, businessman, briefly head of the AI Lisp lab and eventually Channel 9 Boston, 
formally proposed the 1981 Endicott Conference. Rolf Landauer, a somewhat more respectable figure in the field, endorsed it. Tommaso Toffoli of the Toffoli Gate, then a graduate student of Ed Fredkin's, did, did much of the work organizing the conference along with Norman Margolis, another Fredkin graduate student. The conference was monetarily sponsored by a mix of government, corporate, and academic institutions, such as the MIT uh, Lisp Laboratory for Computer Science, the Army Research Office, IBM, the National Science Foundation, and the Xerox Corporation, which at the time had a large research facility. The newspaper description of the conference announced, quote, with the advent of very large scale integration, computer components are becoming so small that the basic principles of statistical, quantum, and relativistic physics appear increasingly important in the design of computing devices. They, the conference organizers, agreed that the limits which computers are now approaching may result in part from the inadequacy of current schemes of computation to explicitly deal with these principles. And they concluded that vastly more efficient computation appears conceivable if we are willing to adapt our concepts so as to acknowledge the laws of the micro world and exploit them in imaginative ways. The conference had a number of notable after effects. One such effect was the solidification of the field of the ph of physics of computation. Physcom conferences continued for 15 years or so after the, after the Endicott conference. There were also several no notable workshops in Turin sponsored by the LSAG Corporation, a prominent Italian defense company, and organized by Tommaso Toffoli, Mario Rossetti, Charles Bennett, and David DiVincenzo. John Wheeler continued to pursue the field, and, and many of his students, such as Deutsch, whose student was Arthur Eckert, Bill Wooters, Wojciech Zurich, Bill Unruh, Bill Schumacher, Richard Feynman, Hugh Everett, and others, went on to make major contributions to quantum computing and information. Carver Mead, Richard Feynman, and John Hopfield, a famous computer scientist known for his work on neural nets, began teaching a class at Caltech on the physics of computation, which actually came out of some of Feynman's work that he presented at the conference. This course later split in three distinct directions. Feynman pursued quantum computing, Mead pursued neuromorphic systems, which eventually became neuromorphic computing, and Hopfield pursued neural networks, which he later became known for. All three, however, continued to be involved in the new field of physics of computation into the 1990s and beyond. Hello, I'm Charles H. Bennett, uh, and I work with IBM Research Division in uh, Yorkton Heights, New York. I've been there almost 50 years, actually, with a few uh, uh, sabbaticals at MIT and BU and, uh, and uh, a postdoc before that at the Argonne Laboratory. I uh, started off as a chemist, but I dra gradually drifted into the physics of information processing. Uh, so I'm going to be talking to you about the conference that happened here in Endicott House uh, 40 years ago, which was instrumental in starting the physics of information processing as a, a respectable field of inquiry. At the time this conference happened, there was nobody who did this as their day job. It was all sort of speculations people had over dinner or a few drinks, and uh, everybody did something else. So when uh, Landauer from uh, IBM and uh, Fredkin and Toffoli from MIT uh, organized this conference, they had to well, they got a, a, an unusual number of, of, of Nobel laureates and really famous people, but they also got some very, very assorted group of other people, and it still only added up to about 45 people. Uh, so the, it's not as if this was the only place where this field got started, but it was sort of a critical nucleus because there were several people who had been thinking about it who were there at once and were able to talk about it together instead of just privately speculating. So, uh, of course, information is the, uh, the, the 20th century was the beginning of the information revolution, which is still going on. <clears throat> but uh, at that point, physics and information processing were two separate fields, pretty well developed separate fields. Uh, and. Uh, well, I'll start off and uh, talk about it a little bit. 
uh, even from the beginning of, of the uh, information revolution in the 19th century, where Babbage had the first, in principle, uh, universal computer, but it would, wasn't able to be built, he thought of it in terms of material like wheat or grain. The processor was called the mill and the memory was called the store. But information doesn't behave quite like that. For example, it can flow through a network more efficiently than any kind of material cargo. Suppose we have some, some red wheat that wants to get from the upper left to the lower right, and some green wheat that wants to get from the upper right to the lower left, and we have the, the black lines outline the possible uh, rail tracks, you have a problem that you can't send the red wheat and the green wheat through on the same track at the same time. But if it's information, we can combine the red and green by an XOR operation and then get through twice as much information, and this is widely used. And this is only already classical information. When we get to quantum information, you can do even more amazing things with it in ways that it doesn't behave like a, a, a material stuff that you're trying to send from one place to another. Or in the, in the mill, uh, it, it doesn't behave like something like wheat that takes work to grind it. And, and number crunching is, is only a, an inexact metaphor. Uh, well, we're gonna go on here. And the, the problem in a way was that physicists and engineers and mathematicians all were all working on this, but they didn't realize that, that there was a need for an overlap between their, their uh, disciplines. And when this field grew up, the physics of information processing, there was a kind of uh, cultural clash and, and, and productive friction that actually led to a new, uh, a new kind of intuition uh, a sense of what were worthwhile problems and, and good ways of approaching them in this new field of, of information, physics of information processing, and indeed the field you could, I guess in, in, in non-English speaking countries is called informatics. It com comprises computation, communication, and storage and retrieval of information. Theoretical computer scientists like, like their counterparts in physics are, are convinced that they're some of the smartest people in the world and they have disdain for other people, that, like uh, physicists, who, who don't prove theorems. And they think, well, physicists, are, 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 well, they can't prove anything because they don't even know what they're talking about. But beginning in the 60s, a few physicists uh, began to bring physics ideas into, into uh, the informatics, uh, thinking that there were some things that had not been properly captured by the, by the successful theories of, of, of Shannon and, and, and von Neumann and, and Turing. And Gilles Brassard was one of the first computer scientists to, to take these physics ideas seriously. Well, here we are at this conference. So pr pretty early on in this, uh, this group of people assembled, and you can see them there. There's, they include some fairly famous people. And I, of course, by this time, it's 40 years ago, a lot of them are not alive anymore, but uh, I went through the list just partially and started Googling and looking up on Wikipedia some of these people. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can see that they had, had some, it was a surprising number of people who had been thinking about this privately and separately and got together and began rubbing off each other, uh, which I'll talk about in more detail. There were several people who weren't there, but who were sort of there in spirit. There was my uh, classmate at Brandeis, Stephen Wiesner, who wrote a revolutionary paper in 1968, but it wasn't published until 83 after this conference. David Deutsch in Oxford, and several of Wheeler's, uh, uh, John Wheeler's students uh, weren't here, but Wheeler was here, and his influence, because he had so many students who were thinking both about information and about uh, gravitation, uh, general relativity. So a lot of the ideas that were formative were here all at once at the same time. Here's Richard Feynman, uh, John Cock, Arthur Burks, and you can, you, of course, there's, there's others there that, that I haven't even gotten around to looking up, and some of them I found out, some of the ones that are unmarked were probably dead by now, uh, but some of them are alive. Well, I mentioned Wiesner, 
he, uh, he submitted a paper, well, he, I guess he submitted it around 1970, but he didn't push to get it published. And he used quantum mechanics to do two things that, that you can't do with ordinary information. Indeed, they fall outside the scope of the very successful theory of Shannon that came out f fully formed from his 1948 paper. Uh, co combining two messages into a, a quantum transmission from which the receiver can receive either one message or the other, but can't get both of them out because reading it one way spoils it for getting the other message out. And a related idea of money that's physically impossible to counterfeit. Uh, here's some of Wiesner's quantum money or a representation of it. Uh, uh, and then based on this idea, Gilles and I, Gilles Bressard and I worked on, on the idea of using it not for storing information that can't be copied, but for uh, c uh, secure communication, quantum cryptography. And, and there at the bottom is our first quantum cryptography apparatus, which could send information secretly over a distance of about, of about 12 inches. <laughs> And this is a piece of lab equipment built by theorists. Uh, well, so what is this quantum information? I often find myself uh, asked to explain it without using any mathematics to people who are, who are not scientists. Well, it, half the job is done. Everybody understands ordinary classical information because we use it all the time. But if you have to put it into a few words without saying anything mathematical, the best metaphor I found was to say that quantum information is like the information in a dream. If you try to describe your dream, that changes your memory of it, and so eventually you forget uh, the dream and you only remember what you said about it. Uh, but unlike dreams, uh, quantum information falls, follows well-established laws. And there's really only one basic law, it's called the superposition principle, uh, between any two reliably distinguishable states of a physical system. Not all states or pairs of states are reliably distinguishable. Uh, there are intermediate states that are not distinguishable from either one, and they correspond to intermediate directions in space, and the two states are reliably distinguishable if their directions are perpendicular. Any two perpendicular directions correspond to reliably distinguishable states, any two directions that are not perpendicular correspond to a pair of states that are different, but not reliably distinguishable. So in the case of photons, there are two reliably distinguishable states, vertical and horizontal, or any two polarization directions at right angles. So you can use them to carry one bit each. The horizontal photons will go through a calcite crystal <coughs> undisturbed, and the vertical ones will get deviated by a set amount. But if you put through diagonal photons, they do something really strange. Some of them become horizontal and go into the one beam, and the others become vertical and go to the other beam. So essentially, by trying to send a photon through this apparatus that is designed to separate two reliably distinguishable states, if it isn't one of those states, it behaves randomly. One of the people who wasn't at this conference except in, 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 uh, in spirit was Bill Wooters, who's been working as long as I've been working, which this is about 50 years, in, uh, in undergraduate education <clears throat> in physics. So he's pretty good at it by now. And he said, well, the way to explain quantum measurement or the way a quantum system behaves when you ask it which of two states it's in when it's not in either of those states but in an intermediate state, he says, it's like an old-fashioned strict school where the, where the the measuring equipment is like a teacher who does not expect the student to ask any questions, but only to answer the question the teacher asks. So the teacher says, uh, and, and the, of course the quantum system is, is, the, is, the, uh, is the student, are you horizontal or vertical? And the student starts saying, well, I'm for polarized about, about 55 five degrees to the, the teacher. Says, I believe I asked you a question. Are you vertical or horizontal? Horizontal, sir. Have you ever had any other polarization? No, sir. I was always horizontal. So this strange behavior, which puzzled the, the physicists of the early 20th century, there's no way around it. You can't measure a single photon's polarization exactly. Uh, you can't clone it and make a lot of copies of it, if, because if you did either of those things, you would be able to do the other. And if you try to clone it, which is what a laser is, is a photon cloning device, 
device. Lasers don't work well except they have if, with a relatively strong input signal. If you try to run a laser on an input signal of one photon, it gets polluted by just enough noise that the output is brighter but no more useful in distinguishing what the original state was. So despite these differences from classical information, there are important similarities which were not noticed during all the years when, when uh, physicists thought of quantum theory as something about physics and information uh, theorists and computer scientists thought about quantum theory as something that explained a particular annoying kind of noise that you get in some physical equipment, which you can deal with with the convenient tools of, of uh, error correcting codes as discovered the, in principle by Shannon and in practice by the whole field of information theory that's been growing since then. But there are some important similarities, parallels, and that is just as you can reduce all classical information processing to processing of bits, working on them one and two at a time, which is, is, is tremendously important in, its, in its, uh, its consequences because you can make the, the bits and the gates smaller and smaller and faster and faster and cheaper and cheaper, and it's still just as good for mathematical purposes, essentially making possible Moore's law. But if I, if I make a pair of shoes a thousand times cheaper and a thousand times uh, smaller, it's not useful for walking. Uh, well, in, in a similar parallel way, quantum information is reducible to qubits. And, uh, and, and, and as we heard, once you learn how to control them as well as we control classical bits, we have a, a, a richer kind of, of, of repertoire of information processing, which is the theory of quantum information, quantum communication, which already quantum cryptography is an example of, and of quantum computing, which is the subject of so much research and development nowadays. But really the most remarkable manifestation of quantum information is entanglement. And entanglement is a, is a property that is not well understood by the general public and alas is not well understood by uh, most science journalists. And as you'll hear later, I think this is partly the fault of Einstein. Because Einstein didn't like entanglement, and everybody else says, well, if Einstein doesn't understand it or doesn't like it or didn't like it, how, what hope is there for me? Well, well, I'm going to try to get over that barrier with, with, with you. Uh, so as I said, any quantum information processing can be done by one and two bit operations, one and two qubit operations. And so, for example, we can have a qubit, which I'm thinking of as a vertical or horizontal photon, uh, the green one is going to try to control the polarization of the orange one. And so if the green one is vertical, the orange one gets rotated 90 degrees to the, to the opposite reliably distinguishable state. If the green one is horizontal, nothing happens to the orange one. So this is a gate which is parallel to the exclusive OR, or, or they call it the controlled not gate. But because this is a quantum gate, it has to obey the superposition principle. So if you give it a superposition of inputs, that is a diagonal green photon, it does the intermediate of what those two upper pictures would do. And this is an entangled state of two photons, which I'll tell you more about in the next slide. Let's look at this state. It's the state that is in, well, since two photons, each of which have two distinguishable states, that makes a set of four possible distinguishable states. So the superposition principle says that if there are four reliably distinguishable states of a green photon and an orange photon, there must be, they must live in a four-dimensional space. And these directions, that is the state that's halfway in four-dimensional space between both horizontal and both vertical, is, if you do the algebra, the same as the state that's halfway between both left diagonal and both right diagonal but is not the same as both of them being diagonal. So you could say the photons are in a definite state of sameness of their polarization, even though they don't either one of them have a polarization in the normal sense of the word themselves. What's it good for? Well, when I said that when you try to measure a system in, 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 in a, along a set of axes that don't correspond to its original state, you, you make it behave randomly. So the uncertainty principle, this is the, the name of that phenomenon, prevents complete information from a system from being extracted from that system in general and put into another particle. 
So if, in other words, how can I get the polarization out of the photon at the lower left and put it into an exactly the same photon at the upper right without cloning it somehow, which we know that it's not possible? Well, uh, in fact, the best that you can do is to try to measure it, but the measurement will in general give you incomplete information and you send that and try to make a copy, but that'll be not exactly the same polarization or it has some chance of error. So how can you do it? Well, we use entanglement to make an end run around this logic. So we start off with not just one photon, so we start with a green photon on the left, photon A, and we start off with a pair of entangled photons, B and C. Uh, and so they are in a state of, uh, let's say, they're in a state of sameness. And what we now do is put the A and B photons together and we don't ask anything about the polarization of the A photon or the B photon. We ask what kind of relation of sameness or difference they have. We're asking the A and B photon to, to say something definite about their relation, which they never even had a relation. So they have to randomly choose a relation. And they choose four different possible answers uh, because two photons have a four-dimensional state space. And they take the result of that measurement, which actually disrupts the state of each one, uh, and they send that result, which is two classical bits, to the other receiving station where the C photon is sitting there, and then they just rotate the C photon in one of four different ways. And what comes out at the other end, if you do the math, is an exact copy of the A photon that was destroyed in the sending process. Quantum information, in addition to behaving in a kind of a different way from, from wheat, it behaves differently from ordinary classical information because it seems like the complete information in the particle A, photon A, gets split into two parts. One of them goes from A to the measurement state place to the place where it interacts with the entangled photon and comes out there. So essentially part of that information would have to go backward in time because it goes to do something with the B particle which has already been put into an entangled state with a C particle. So this just shows this is, this is mathematically makes sense. It seems counterintuitive, but the goal, the, the, the command that nature is giving us is saying, well, this is how I am. It's your job now to understand it and to make it seem natural and intuitive to you. And that's what, that, that's what people in, in, in our field are, are trying to do nowadays, even to a lay audience. So there are these two dual protocols, uh, which are, both involve sort of this, this behavior of information that is different from classical information. In one case, it seems to go backward in time. In another case, you can send a quantum state without, uh, without, part of it goes backward in time, the part that can't be copied, and the part that can be copied has been so badly randomized that copying it does you no good. So entanglement is, is ubiquitous. Almost every interaction between two systems creates entanglement. So why wasn't it discovered in the tw until the 20th century? Well, the answer is because of monogamy. Most systems in nature, other than tiny ones like single photons, interact so strongly with their environment that they become entangled with almost immediately, which degrades the correlations among the parts of the system into mere correlated randomness. Now, Einstein's difficulties with Bohr and the debate over about a decade between them on, on, on interpreting quantum theory and, and deciding whether they liked it are really the first phase of the cultural adjustment that gave birth to quantum uh, information theory. And as I mentioned, there were two kinds of weird behavior that Einstein didn't like. The indeterminacy, that is a system prepared in an identical state originally and subjected to the same treatment behaves sometimes one way and sometimes the other way. It's an exemplified by the measuring a polarized photon or simply by just waiting in, in front of a specimen of radioactive material the atoms are all identical to begin with, but after an hour, some of them will decay and some of them won't. Unlike a hospital where when some of the people die, it's because they were sick or are already at the beginning. Now, the other thing that bothered Einstein was entanglement, this sort of excessively strong correlation between things that, that are too far apart to influence each other. And he called, uh, he called, he had nasty names for both of them. He called the indeterminacy God playing dice, and he called the entanglement spooky action at a distance. And he, he felt that, uh, that in order to be a 
successful explanation of nature, every effect should have a cause that is not indeterminacy. There should be no effects that don't have a cause, and the cause should be nearby. It should not be somewhere too far away to plausibly influence the thing. Uh, and Newton's mechanics, Maxwell's electromagnetism, and his own relativity have this common sense property. Meanwhile, the rest of the physics community went on and accepted these things and said, well, we'll have to learn how to live with them. And Einstein never did. Uh, and in fact, I would say that this, his distaste for it, as I said earlier, was part of the reason that people still, the lay public still doesn't uh, understand quantum mechanics. And uh, I, I don't tweet often, but the one time I did tweet was to say that Einstein uh, thought entanglement was spooky, but his wrong take on it uh, as action at a distance refuses to die. And that's uh, spooky delayed action. Uh, so in other words, he couldn't conceive of this strong correlation existing without an influence passing from one particle to the other. But the, the, the lack of ability to influence is inextricably bound up with the random behavior of the parts in a, in a way that's mathematically beautiful. But not understanding that and mistakenly believing that entanglement could be used for long-range com communication, Nick Herbert published a paper, uh, and, and, and Jack Sarfati tried to patent it. Well, uh, the refutation of these, as I heard it, the paper that Nick uh, uh, submitted, the referee, and I'm not exactly sure who it was, decided that it was wrong, but the right thing to do was to, to recommend it for publication because that would cause its wrongness to be discovered and, and publicized. And that's exactly what happened. When the paper came out, Wooders and Zurich and independently Deeks pointed out why the, the strong correlation of entanglement and the random behavior of the parts are not usable for any kind of communication. And this no cloning principle is sort of like the, the, uh, the, the idea that, that, that entanglement can be used for, for instantaneous communication is like perpetual motion. It's always being, being rediscovered. Well, the way science progresses is not uh, by a series of breakthrough discoveries that are appreciated instantly. Sometimes somebody who discovers something don't realize it's, it's, it's how important it is. The, the no cloning theorem was discovered as far as we know, first proved in 1970, but the author didn't make a big deal of it. And so the, it wasn't really appreciated until this wrong paper of Sarfati, uh, I mean of, of uh, Herbert, was published and criticized. So this shows how bad ideas sometimes stimulate scientific progress. And conversely, good ideas, even quantum mechanics itself, uh, uh, often uh, impede scientific progress. Thank you for your attention. As Charlie just mentioned in his talk, Gilles Broussard was one of the first computer scientists to take the physics of computation seriously. This was particularly notable as quantum concepts such as Wiesner's idea of quantum money potentially violated the extended church Turing thesis. The Church-Turing thesis is one of the central tenets of theoretical computer science and one of its most foundational assumptions. Briefly, um, it states that every effective computation can be efficiently carried out by a Turing machine or a cellular automaton or RAM. In other words, that any reasonable model of computation can be simulated by another one. Even before Shor's discovery, quantum cryptography, most famously Ben and Broussard's BB-84, threatened this fundamental principle. At the time, in 1984, uh, computer scientists brushed aside the suggestion that quantum cryptography imperiled Church Turing. Computer scientists similarly dismissed Deutsch's 1985 paper about a quantum Turing machine, basically along these lines, because while the speedups might be exponential, the overheads, for example, the time would take to load the information necessary to do the computation, would be exponential as well. In the early 1990s, Umesh Vazirani, one of the first major computer scientists aside from Gilles involved in the field, uh, became interested in this line of inquiry through Feynman's 1981 Endicott paper. 
In particular, uh, the, the possibility that Feynman's paper was in some way suggesting a path by which one could say nature violates the extended church Turing thesis uh, fascinated Vazirani. This revolutionary possibility convinced him to drop what he was working on and study quantum mechanics. For Vazirani, this formulation suggested, as Feynman states in his paper, that the physical world is not the classical world and, and that nature isn't classical, damn it. <laughs> Vazirani and his group at Berkeley soon demonstrated that there was, in fact, an efficient quantum Turing machine, meaning one without the exponential overhead. And with the bernstein vazirani algorithm, that there was indeed a problem for which you could get a super polynomial speed up, and therefore a, a violation of the church Turing thesis. In mainstream computer scientists, science, there was an immediate buzz around this that soon subsided as it remained philosophical without having an, an interesting application. Vazirani and his group also soon shown, with Bennett and Brazard, that, that not all algorithms would have an exponential speed up and that therefore it would be possible to have a post quantum cryptography. Um, and this was a genuine concern for agencies like NSA, who were really worried that cryptography might be seriously threatened going forward. The very next year after Bernstein Vazirani, uh, Shor's algorithm, a draft of which he actually sent to Vazirani, immediately recentered the possibility that Church Turing had been violated. There was finally sort of a meaningful application, an important application. Um, a year or two went by without any further algorithms and without error correction. Those in computer science thought that maybe the computer scientists who had predicted this had, had sort of misunderstood what the quantum physicists were saying and that quantum computation practitioners were in error about anything violating church turing. In more recent years, uh, computer scientists have been able to, to continue to escape reckoning with the implications for their field because until very recent quantum computing experiments, there were no quantum computers capable of physically violating the church the extended church Turing thesis. With these proofs of concepts, the, the existential nature of this violation has clo come closer to home according to several practitioners in the field I've talked to. A more profound reckoning will likely come with a quantum computer which can in fact implement Shor's algorithm. Regardless, um, quantum information has had several important effects on the practice of classical computer science. The prospect of faster quantum algorithms has pushed classical computer scientists to develop faster classical F algorithms, basically in order to disprove any quantum speedup. Quantum algorithms have also inspired a class of classical algorithms called quantum-inspired algorithms, which have improved on previous classical algorithms. Shor's impact on quantum computing and information more broadly is, is probably pretty obvious for you guys in the field. Um, but his algorithmic work popularized the field and brought government and eventually industry interest. It also consolidated the field around the idea of building a quantum computer. Um, research became oriented around the construction of these machines and the discovery of a similarly fast uh, quantum algorithm. Certain researchers feel like this was a positive structural element which helped the field mature, uh, while others complained that it was premature and sort of overly constraining. Shor's re research likewise prompted several experimentalists working on other fundamental physics problems or, or projects um, in, or other applications such as atomic clocks to turn to quantum computing research. Uh, Shor's effort, efforts helped the field transform from a hobby side interest with no tangible product to a major institutionalized pursuit. Together with the work of many other scientists, this work helped convince the US government, and, and by way of that, the broader world, that quantum computing was not science fiction, but instead a future worthy of investment. Hi, I'll be talking about some recollections about when I um, discovered the factoring algorithm. But first I thought we should go back and talk about where I was when this conference was being held. So when I was, in 1981, I was a senior at Caltech, which is the same place Richard Feynman was. And so obviously um, Feynman was preparing his um, keynote address when I was um, you know, studying and getting ready to graduate but I didn't hear anything about Feynman's keynote address or 
um, or quantum computation. What I did hear from Feynman, there was a very interesting lecture that I went to called Negative Probability, and I'll mention it because first, he says a few things about negative probability in his keynote address, and second, I think it shows some, you know, shed some light on Feynman. So in this lecture, Feynman um, said that, you know, he was um, been looking at Bell's theorem, and Bell's theorem is this um, proof that Bell had that shows that the EPR paradox is unavoidable, that really quantum mechanics cannot be local and realistic. I won't tell you what realistic means, but um, that disturbed a number of physicists, apparently including Feynman. So he looked very carefully over all the hypotheses that went into Bell's theorem to see if there were any hidden assumptions that he could look at, and he found one. The hidden assumption was that all probabilities were between zero and one. So he asked himself, suppose we let the probabilities be any real numbers, less than zero or bigger than one, and we arrange things so that only when you add up the probabilities to get the probability of some observable event, it has to be between zero and one. So this was his idea, and we, um, well, he hadn't worked it out when he gave the talk, and apparently he never worked it out because he published a few year, paper a few years later called Negative Probability. And the very interesting thing about this paper was that this motivation for this negative probability work was absent from the paper. He didn't mention anything about Bell's theorem. He mentioned the, as motivation, well, is there any way we can avoid these infinities that appear in renormalization, and that um, is, you know, that's another big paradox of quantum mechanics that nobody has done anything about. So I think this shows, uh, you know, that Feynman was really careful cultivating his mystique. He didn't mention the motiva original motivation in the paper because, you know, it, was, it would have been clear that he had been wrong about this and that he wasn't able to resolve the paradox of Bell's theorem. So he found another motivation for this work, which didn't destroy this Feynman mystique of never making mistakes. And there's another interesting thing about that, too. It shows that Feynman didn't take his own advice. In 1964, at a set of lectures at MIT, he said, I'm going to tell you what nature behaves like. If you will simply admit that she does behave like this, you will find her a delightful, entrancing thing. But do not keep saying to yourself, if you can possibly avoid it, but how can it be like that? How can it be like that? Because you will get down the drain into a blind alley from which nobody has ever escaped. Nobody knows how it can be like that. But you know, 15 years after he gave that lecture, he then, um, disobeyed his words and started worrying about how could it be like that. And it was a blind alley, just like he predicted. Of course, the, maybe the advice he was giving wasn't to professors who were tenured, but for graduate students. I mean, the only graduate student I know about who did a lot of, you know, had a successful thesis on the foundations of quantum mechanics and um, Avoiding Bell's theorem is Hugh Everett, who um, proposed the many worlds theory in his graduate PhD thesis. And he left academia after he graduated. So now I want to skip ahead to the next time. The first time I heard about quantum computing, it was a talk that Charlie Bennett gave at Bell Labs. And I don't remember the exact dates, but it was obviously after Bell's theorem in 1986. And I think it must have been, or not Bell's theorem, it was after BB84 in 1984, but it must have been before um, Charlie Bell, 
built his um, QKD apparatus in 1991 because I don't remember the apparatus from the talking of. Anyway, Charlie gave the BB-84 key, key distribution protocol and he asked an open question, which was, um, is there any way of proving mathematically that this is secure? So I thought about it for a while, but I gave up because I was completely stumped at how you would take the BB-84 quantum key distribution protocol and turn it into rigorous mathematics, which um, is rather ironic because, you know, in 2000, John Preskill and I gave the first simple proof of the security of BB-84. Of course, that was after we'd learned all about quantum information and quantum computation and quantum error correction, and all of the stuff we've learned went into that simple proof. Okay, so I gave up on worrying about um, proving the security of quantum key distribution, but then a few years later, in 1992, Umesh Vazirani came to Bell Labs and he gave his talk on Bernstein and Vazirani, where he put quantum Turing machines into a mathematically rigorous um, framework and where he um, had an uh, algorithm for a contrived problem, the bernstein vazirani problem, which seemed to run faster on a quantum machine, Turing machine than on a classical computer. So that really intrigued me and I started thinking about whether there were any more um, useful or more convincing problems that could be done on a quantum computer much more efficiently than on a classical computer. I didn't get anywhere on this question until I saw a paper of Dan Simons and Simon was looking at this problem, find the period on the vertices of a high dimensional cube. So here's a three dimensional cube in which case the problem is trivial, but if you have a 500 dimensional cube, it suddenly gets very hard. So there's a function on the vertices and this function is the property that if you go into the screen and then move horizontally, you will see a vertex of the same color. So that means that these um, colors of the vertices are periodic because if you add a binary vector to one of them, you will get another one of the same color. So Simon's problem was given a function like this, which you only can access as an oracle, find the period. And the way he did this was by applying what is essentially a Fourier transform over a binary vector space. So I looked at Simon's problem and I knew that Fourier transforms were very good at finding periodicity. And I knew that the discrete log problem was also very much related to periodicity. And the discrete log problem is one which if you look at public key crypto systems, there are some public key crypto systems that the discrete pro log problem is the key to breaking it. If you could solve the discrete log problem, you could break the crypto systems. So a similar thing holds for factoring. If you can factor large numbers rapidly, you can break the RSA crypto system. But discrete log problem, you break the Diffie-Hillman crypto system, which is not as common but which is still a very important problem. So I started looking at whether you could solve discrete log problem. And so for the discrete log problem, that looks very similar to Simon's problem. Now the function is not on a high dimensional cube, but on a very large torus. And there's a period there. So in this example, if you move two vertices to the right and one vertex down, you see another vertex, which is of the same color. And if you can find the period of this function on a large torus where you can only query the colors of the vertices by an oracle, you can solve discrete log. I knew that the Fourier transform was very important for finding periods, so I figured out how to take the Fourier transform on a quantum computer 
over exponentially large um, period. And then I figured out how to apply it to uh, so I'll get discrete log. And there's a very embarrassing thing here, which is that I had seen Simon's paper when I was on the program committee for um, stock. So there's two big conferences in computer science, um, stock and Fox, and papers in those conferences are treated kind of the way physicists treat phys rev papers. The story, which I don't think is really true in either case, is that people count up the number of stock and fox papers, and if you have enough of them, they give you tenure. Anyway, uh, we rejected Simon's paper from the conference. And then before it actually appeared, I realized I could use the idea to find, um, you know, to come up with a discrete log and factoring algorithm. So I called Simon and, you know, got him to send my, my paper and, um, so I would have a legitimate copy, and then I went and, um, you know, wrote my paper. And Simon said that he never would have figured this out, so he didn't really mind that. <laughs> that. But I, you know, and I was arg and I, at least I argued for accepting Simon's paper. I obviously didn't argue hard enough for it. I should have been jumping up and down and say, "You absolutely have to take this paper." But I did argue for it, and I guess. Theoretical computer scientists didn't think highly of quantum computation, so it got rejected. Once I'd solved the discrete log problem, I gave a talk about it at Bell Labs. So before the talk, I'd only to told a handful of people about it, including Jeff Legarius, who found a very minor error and we fixed it, and my boss, um, David Johnson. But the talk was in Henry Landau's seminar which is an internal seminar at Bell Labs, which has a very active audience. You know, the speaker gets constantly pelted by questions, and there have been at least one or two occasions when people have never been able to get through more than the first two or three of their um, transparencies because they got so many questions they um, didn't manage to get anywhere in their talk. But actually, it went very well. And then I went back to work and I managed to solve the factoring problem a few days later. And that weekend, so five days after my talk, I got a call from Umesh Vazrani saying, I hear you can factor on a quantum computer. Tell me how it works. So there is a couple of interesting things. First, the rumor mill must have spread the result very rapidly. And second, if you know the old children's game of telephone, one person whispers something to the next, who whispers something to the next, who whispers something to the next, and it's completely changed by the time it gets around to the first person. Well, I had told everyone I'd solved discrete log, and I don't think I told anyone other than maybe one or two people that had been able to solve factoring as well, but somehow the rumor changed discrete log to factoring. Now, that's not too uncommon because there's an interesting relationship between the problems of discrete log and factoring. They can both be used to get public key crypto systems, and anytime anyone has ever found an algorithm for one of them, some time later, maybe six months, maybe a couple of years, the techniques from that algorithm can be used to apply to the other one. However, it's not the case that you can take any algorithm and with some kind of, um, you know, stick it in some kind of machine and turn the crank and get an algorithm for discrete log out of the algorithm for factoring or vice versa. It's just that they are similar enough problems that one algorithm for one usually gives an algorithm for the other with enough thought. So, um, yeah, when Umesh calls me, I told him that I how to factor large numbers on a quantum computer. And the news spread very rapidly after that. So, um, I think the first thing was there was a uh, yeah, so Umesh Vazirani 
was, you know, called me on the phone. But the first time I talked about that with anybody was Charlie Bennett. There was a Columbia Thury Day, which was held um, twice a year in New York City. And there was one in late April. And Charlie Bennett and John Smullen and I arranged to get together at the Thury Day. And I could talk about the factoring algorithm to him. And then he explained some interesting things about quantum um, <coughs> puzzles and quantum information to me. And so that's that. Then next thing was I gave a conference at the Cornell Algorithmic Number Theory Symposium, which I think was the first of a annual conference. And um, I was invited at the last minute. This was the first few days in May. And so I flew up and gave my talk. And um, yeah, there was someone from the NSA there who came up and asked me questions about it afterwards. Um, there was a conference at the Santa Fe Institute in mid-May, and I couldn't go, but Umesh Vazirani talked about the factoring algorithm. And so a lot of people heard about it from there. And let's see. And that, you know, I was deluged for my requests for my paper. I got interviewed by a bunch of magazines and I think the next big conference was a conference arranged by NIST in um, Gatorsburg, and that was in August. <clears throat> and it was specially arranged because of the factoring algorithm. And, you know, despite the fact that someone from the NSA asked me questions at the talk at um, Cornell, a lot of people from the NSA didn't know anything about the, or at least have told me they didn't know anything about the um, factoring result before the conference. And then there was, after this, there was a conference in Torino that fall. There was a conference in Texas, which was the Physics and Computation Conference, which was sort of a follow up to the 1981 Endicap House Conference. I think that was called FizCop 94. And then there was Fox, which I had submitted my paper to. And both Simon's paper and my paper got accepted to Fox. And I presented the um, result there. So there was one big objection to quantum computation. And Rolf Landauer apparently already brought it up at the May conference at the Santa Fe Institute which is that you cannot correct errors on a quantum computer, or at least it looked like you could not correct errors on a quantum computer. So why can't you? Well, it's basically there's a no cloning theorem. There are a bunch of techniques for dealing with faults on a digital computer. One of them is checkpointing, where you take your state of your computation and you write it down so the computation gets derailed by an error after that point, you can go back to the checkpoint and you don't have to go back to the original thing. Another um, is error correcting codes and error correcting codes introduce a few redundant bits. So if you make one error in the um, bits of a word in memory, you can use the redundant bits to um, fix it. And then finally, there's massive redundancy where you keep many copies of all your bits around and continually compare them and fix them by taking the majority. So it looked like none of these techniques could actually be used to correct errors on a quantum computer. I mean, checkpointing, what you do is you take your computation and you write it, the state of your computer down that's making a copy. That's, allow uh, that's not allowed. Um, for quantum error correcting codes, you take your bits that you have in memory and you make parity check bits, which are you know, essentially redundant copies. So that also looked like it was um, cop no cloning. So that wasn't allowed either. And the final thing, um, massive redundancy. Well, if you have five copies of your computation running 
and one of them derails. Now there's only four. Now you want to take the four good copies and turn them into five good copies. That's cloning two. You're not allowed to take four copies of the quantum state and turn it into five copies because it violates the non-cloning theorem. So it looks like you cannot fix errors on a quantum computer. And if you can't fix errors, then you have to do your computation perfectly. And if you have, say, a billion steps in your computation, which is what you need to factor a, I guess, cryptographically important number, then you need to do each part, each step in your computation accurate to one part in a billionth. And you ask experimental physicists, and they'll tell you that's absolutely impossible. So if you want to get an estimate for what the state of the art was, um, Jeff Kimball estimated that you know, the techniques at the time could do one two quantum bit gate with around 80% accuracy, which is pretty pathetic if you want to do a billion gates with um, one part in a billion accuracy for each of them. However, it turns out that quantum error correcting codes don't actually need to clone things. So the simplest classical error correcting code is you take zero and you encode it by zero, zero, zero. You take one and you encode it by one, one, one. And you can do that on quantum um, bits too. You can encode zero by zero, 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 and one by one, one, one. And this is not cloning because if you take zero plus one, so a superposition of zero and one, you don't get three copies of the superposition you get the superposition of the encoded zero and the encoded one. So this code corrects bit errors fine. So bit errors essentially behave the way that the bits in classical error, classical, um, error correcting codes work, but it does not correct phase errors. If you make a phase error and one qubit, you actually make a phase error for the encoded qubit. So that means that phase errors are three times as likely because if you have some rate of phase errors in your qubits, then the error, error rate in your logical qubits is three times as fast. Now what I realized was that there's a transformation that takes bit errors to phase errors and phase errors to bit errors. So you can apply that transformation to the code and um, now it will correct any phase errors but bit errors are three times more likely. So what do we do? I mean, we have the errors. It looks like you can protect the bit errors, so squeeze the um, encoded qubit one way, but then the um, other kind of error becomes more likely. So is this something that's unavoidable, or can we fix this? Well, I realized that there's a nine qubit code correcting any single qubit error, and it's formed just by taking these two codes and concatenating them. First you encode using the phase error correcting code, and then you encode each qubit of the resulting three qubit code with the bit error correcting code, and you've encoded one qubit into nine qubits, and it corrects any single qubit error. So sometime after I wrote this, and I've never you know, so it was too late to include this in my paper that gave the nine qubit code and I never bothered to publish it anywhere. I discovered that Asher Perez had actually discovered the three qubit, th the three qubit code that corrects bit errors much earlier. So in 1985, he wrote this paper called Reversible Logic and Quantum Computers. And in it, he started worrying about errors for quantum computers and he proposed this three qubit code. And you can see that this 000 plus 111, except he calls them spin up and spin down, um, he's included this code. He didn't need to worry about correcting phase errors because he was just worried about doing classical computations on a quantum computer. And if you do classical computations on a quantum computer, 
phase errors don't matter. So Perez discovered the bit three qubit code that corrects bit errors and actually said some interesting things about it much earlier than my paper. After I wrote the nine qubit paper, I started thinking about maybe there are better quantum error correcting codes. After all, the repetition code had been known for thousands of years, classically, and nobody had invented the better error correcting codes until um, the 1950s. So I started thinking, well, there should be some more efficient quantum error correcting codes too, because we know one, but it's the analog of the very um, inefficient classical repetition code. So I started looking at repetition codes. Now the classical Hamming code encodes four bits into seven bits and corrects one error, and this is probably the simplest classical error correcting code. It was discovered by um, you know, Hamming around 1950. And um, well, you can do a quantum Hamming code too. And playing around with the classical Hamming code, I got the quantum Hamming code. And what this does is it encodes one qubit into seven qubits and corrects one error. And you can see that it's just made by superimposing states of the classical Hamming code. So I showed this to Rob Calderbank, who was also at AT&T and was an expert on classical coding theory. And we generalized this to a whole class of codes you can construct, which were CSS codes. And Andrew Steen discovered the quantum Hammond code as well as this class at approximately the same time. And so they're now called CSS codes after Steen and Calderbank and myself. <clears throat> so inspired by this, a bunch of groups started investigating more complicated codes. So what they did was they put, you know, computers to work on trying to figure out codes and two groups, one at IBM and one at Los Alamos, discovered a code that codes one qubit into five qubits and corrects one error. And um, they actually discovered two different codes, but it was easy to see that they were just one could easily be transformed into another. And in fact, this is probably neither of them, but another, you know, a transformation that makes them look more symmetric. Anyway, I saw these papers and I said, well, there's obviously a lot of structure to the five qubit code because you can look at all the symmetries and it has a ton of symmetries. So there must be some reason it exists, some way of systematically discovering it and describing it. So I started looking around that and I wanted to figure out what the symmetry group of this code was. So I asked Neil Sloan, who was another mathematician working at Bell Labs, how would you find symmetry group of this code? So he said, well, you should use the program Magma. And he gave me a uh, example Magma program that he had was working on a different problem and he had just run to compute the group of symmetries of something else. So I you know, put this code up on Magma and wrote a program and it spit out the fact that the group was 5,160,960 elements in it. And this happened to be exactly the same number as Neil Sloan had found. <clears throat> so we looked at it more closely and not only were they the same size group, they were the same group. And in fact, there was a deep connection between packings in Grassmannian space, which is what Neil Sloan was looking at, and quantum error correcting codes. And that gave us the hint to figure out how this code was constructed. It comes from additive codes over the field with four elements. And, you know, using this construction, we could find many, many, many more quantum codes. 
And this is in fact the theory of stabilizer codes, which were developed, you know, which were discovered and named by Dan Gottesman the same time that we had done our work. So I believe that's all I have time for. And thank you very much for listening. I'm very happy to have been part of this 40th anniversary celebration of the original Endicott House Conference on um, Physics and Computation. And I hope to enjoy the rest of it. Yasunobu Nakamura had, had never heard of Shor when he started working on superconducting quantum rings in the early 1990s. Um, his interest, in fact, arrived from so-called pure physics, and in particular, Tony Leggett's proposal for macroscopic quantum coherence in the 1980s. The superconducting rings that he used were more or less qubits, but weren't seen as such until much later, or until somewhat later. In 1997, he did an experiment with a superconducting ring where he tried to show macroscopic superposition and, and, and actually sent an email to Tony Leggett asking if he had achieved macroscopic coherence. Leggett replied simply, no. Um, along with many in his field, he learned quantum information because of Shor's discovery of error correction and the proliferation of conferences and workshops around the new field and its sort of newfound sort of legitimacy. Then in 1999, Nakamura demonstrated electrical coherent control of a qubit in a solid state electronic device. This 1999 result spurred research in solid state qubits by many groups working in his field. And, and as you'll soon, soon hear, Steve Gervin, uh, this, this brought Steve Gervin into the field as well. Soon after, with Hans Moe's group, he created the first flux qubit, which Moe had previously proposed in 1998 after a conference in Santa Barbara. Joseph's injunction technology, however, has a much longer history, dating back to the same historical moment that, as the conference which happened here 40 years ago. Prompted by the exact same discussions about the near-term limits of silicon that produced the Endicott Conference, big companies like Bell Labs and IBM began several experiments with different computing architectures. The Joseph's Injunction Project, one of the predecessors to modern-day superconducting technology, was one such alternative architecture. Bell Labs and Japan's Ministry of Trade and Industry invested in this technology, but the earliest large program was at IBM in the mid-1960s. This project, uh, supported by Robert Keyes and Ralph Landauer, promised low power requirements and a significant speed up over silicon. Some even believed that there could be a Moore's law for superconductors, which would outpace Moore's law for silicon. Several government agencies were interested for independent reasons. Uh, NASA and DOD wanted circuits which could resist radiation better than silicon did uh, for things like their space missions and, and, and other types of sort of defense applications. Likewise, NSA was invested in this project because its unique signal processing and cryptography applications put a premium over on, on speed, uh, not manufacturability, because these superconducting computers were very hard to manufacture. The project was one of the first investments of the NSA in 1972, which at the time was an agency completely unknown to most citizens. The NSA's involvement was unknown to many of the participants in the Joseph's Injunction project, even though at its peak, uh, they contributed about a quarter of the funding for the $20 million project. The project was abandoned in 1983, somewhat abruptly because of the speed at which Moore's Law had continued for silicon. It made you know, superconducting seem impractical. There were 80 people on the project uh, in 1981, and just two years later, there were about 15. A lot of those researchers had to move on to other fields, but the people who were just basically doing the physics of it stuck around. Uh, a few of the original Joseph's Injunction researchers later became important collaborators in early superconducting quantum computing at IBM. While IBM no longer deemed Joseph's Injunctions worthy of investment at the time, uh, the DOD and NSA continued to feel differently. Uh, they felt that if a dedicated national superconducting electronics facility was not built, the previous investment would be a waste and, and the field would die, they would lose experts, and that this would be both to their detriment and to the detriment of national security. And they were particularly concerned 
that the Japanese continued to invest in this technology. And, and this was at a moment where there were lots of fears about Japanese overtaking uh, the US in terms of computing uh, technology. Robert Koch, who started working at IBM in 1982, actually bridged the gap between this earlier form of Joseph's injunction technology and later Joseph's injunction qubits for superconducting quantum computers. He oversaw several of the early quantum information practitioners, such as David DiVincenzo, and was one of the first to decide to switch his experimental research to quantum computing. As a grad student at Berkeley, uh, Koch was, one of, was, was in John Clark's group, uh, the same group in the 1980s, uh, which produced John Martinez, Michel de Veray, and, and many, other, many other notable figures. This group had been thinking about how Joseph's injunctions behaved somewhat like atoms at, at the time. Much of the other basic research into quantum computing architectures derived from other types of fundamental physics research. So, so much like Nakamura's research in superconducting qubits, the early research in ion trap computers from Dave Weiland, Chris Monroe, Ignacio Serac, and Peter Zoller emerged from pre-existing research on atomic clocks, um, which were used for GPS technology. Similarly, topological quantum computing relies on Majorana fermion qubits, which would also conventionally be the subject of fundamental physics research. Even if no com quantum computers are realized in the near term, experimental research in quantum information has, has also been a way uh, for scientists to get funding to pr pursue fundamental physics research. And, and, and this support is especially important in a context where basic research has much less funding than in previous eras. The experiments and theory which have arisen thanks to uh, the experiments in quantum computation will likely continue to produce ripple effects which change our understanding of quantum mechanics and therefore the nature of reality for some time to come. Hello, I'm Steve Gervin professor of physics and applied physics at Yale University and director of the co-design center for quantum advantage at Brookhaven National Laboratory. I'm going to talk to you about the history of superconducting qubits, a challenging task because of the explosion of activity in the last quarter century. But, so I won't be able to cover all of the threads, but I'll pick a few of them to illustrate the tremendous advances that have occurred. So let's start at the beginning. Information is physical. Quantum information is stored in the states of quantum objects called qubits and can be represented as superpositions of the occupation of the two lowest energy levels of the, among the quantized energy levels of any quantum system. You can see on the right an experiment I did with a uh, compact fluorescent light bulb, sending the light through a slit, bouncing off a compact disk. You can see the discrete colors in the spectrum representing the transitions, the quantum jumps, of the electrons in the atom among the different levels. It's very important that the colors of these, uh, the light emitted in these transitions is different, that the energy level spacing is not uniform. In this case, the blue light, if you have blue light from a laser to match the color of the fluorescent blue light that you see, you can control the superposition of the zero and one states and not excite the atom into higher states because that takes a different color of light, green in this case. So the minimal engineering requirement for a qubit is to be able to control the superposition state of the two lowest levels, and this requires the spectrum to be anharmonic. So this is uh, all about engineering, and uh, I'll give a simple definition of engineering, optimization subject to constraints. What other skill in life do you need? Unfortunately, for the case of qubits, we have severe conflicting constraints. 
In order to have very long coherence times for the qubits to remember the quantum information, they have to be completely isolated from the outside world and from each other and remain unobserved because in quantum mechanics, the act of observing a state changes it. In complete conflict with this constraint that will give us long coherence time is the constraint that we have to be able to change the state of the qubit very rapidly. We need fast control and we need strong and accurate readout of the state of the system. Both of these requirements require very strong coupling of the qubits to the outside world. So the history of the field, so far at least, is the story of this struggle to optimize systems in the face of these conflicting constraints. So one choice you can make in the optimization is between using natural atoms and ions and synthetic atoms, superconducting qubits. Synthetic atoms are very nice, of course. They're not simply identical, but they're literally indistinguishable in a deep quantum mechanical sense. They have very long coherence times. They generally work well at room temperature. But at the same time, because they have, they have long coherence times, because they do not couple very strongly to electromagnetic radiation and therefore to each other and therefore to the readout system. Also, you have to deal with lasers and their amplitude and phase noise and control of the spatial modes of the lasers, all of which are expensive and challenging. Synthetic atoms, superconducting qubits, have nice engineering properties. They can be individually designed, engineered, and optimized. They're a bit like people from California. Each one is their own distinct individual. Unlike people from California, they work best near absolute zero, and uh, one has to have an expensive refrigerator to achieve that condition. They have modest but strongly improved coherence times over what they were at the beginning of the field. A very powerful advantage is that they're natural for use in electronic circuits and chips. And their macroscopic size, they're typically a millimeter in size, implies strong coupling to electromagnetic fields for fast control and multi-qubit gates. Also, at least those of us who um, work with radios feel that the microwave amplitude, phase, and spatial mode control with off-the-shelf equipment is much easier for microwaves than it is for lasers. So let's go back now to the prehistory, which is the discovery of the Josephson effect a prediction by Brian Josephson, which is related to what happens in a Josephson tunnel junction, two metal electrodes that are superconducting, separated by a th uh, few atom thick insulating barrier. And the state, the macroscopic state into which Cooper pairs of electrons in a superconductor condense is defined by a phase phi, and it's related to a microscopic property of the quantum field amplitude for pairs of up and down spin electrons. But it is itself effectively a classical property. It, it is connected, it determines the current through the junction and its time rate of change controls the uh, voltage, as you can see in this, these um, Josephson equations up here. It's been known since the 1960s that this phase variable phi acts like the position of a particle that obeys Newton's equations of motion for classical particles, F equals ma. In this case, the mass of the particle is played by the capacitance in the circuit and the force acting on the particle comes from the bias current which is supplied to the uh, junction and there's an oscillating term which produces 
a um, tilted washboard potential, as you see in the graph. There's also a viscous damping term, the third term in the equation, and it's inversely proportional to the resistance in the circuit. I should perhaps stop at this point and quote uh, the late, great Mike Tinkham for you young people in the audience uh, who don't know what a washboard is. It's a classical analog of a Josephson junction that used to be used for cleaning clothes. So the key thing you need to know about this is what happens if the particle should escape one of these wells, potential wells in the washboard, and begin rolling downhill. You can see from uh, the uh, Josephson equation up here that the velocity of the particle produces an external easily measured voltage in the circuit proportional to the time rate of change of the position of the particle. And that can be used to detect the escape of the particle from the well. And we'll use that uh, uh, that will appear in uh, later discussion of early experiments. So, Tony Leggett in the 1980s began to ask the question, well, if this phase across the Josephson junction acts like the position of a classical particle and it's in a bound in a potential well, is there any possibility that that particle could itself exhibit macroscopic quantum behavior. That is, its position could be uncertain. It should be described by a uh, wave function with a probability amplitude for different positions. A second important question that Tony asked was just how macroscopic would this object be uh, if it's quantum mechanical? And what, what do these words even mean? And uh, so I will try to illustrate them with an analogy developed by my colleague, Michel Deveret. So the phase of a superconducting condensate is a macroscopic but classical manifestation of quantum order. Just as the discrete facet angles of a crystal our macroscopic manifestation of the existence of quantum ordered microscopic objects, the individual atoms. And these beautiful right angle cleavage planes in this pyrite crystal are there because they are a reflection of the right angles that exist in the microscopic simple cubic packing of the atoms in this compound. And this is the first experimental evidence for the existence of atoms and was uh, known to the ancient Greeks. This is sort of level one of the way that macroscopic manifestations of quantum mechanics can occur. But there's a second and deeper level, which is that the orientation of the crystal in space depends on the collective center of mass motion of the entire crystal. And only under very special circumstances do quantum effects of this collective coordinate, which is rather massive, become visible. But this is exactly what we need in order to build a superconducting qubit. So Tony had asked this question in 1980 and the group of John Clark at Berkeley, together with young postdoc Michel Deveret and beginning student John Martinez, decided to try to experimentally verify the quantization of the energy levels of this phase particle trapped in one of the wells of the tilted washboard potential. And they succeeded in a series of landmark papers uh, beginning in 1985. And the way they did it was to do spectroscopy on this artificial atom, just as I showed you the, the uh, visible spectrum of the light from uh, the atoms in a compact fluorescent bulb on the first slide. Here they sent in microwave tones to cre create excitations between the discrete quantized levels of the atom, and then to detect 
the quantization of the energy levels of these particles, they used spectroscopy, much like the uh, spectrum I showed you for, of optical light uh, on the first slide. But here, they used microwave radiation to excite the, art the atom or the phase particle from one quantized energy level to the second. And then to detect that that happened, it's impossible to really see that tiny amount of energy absorbed. But once the particle's excited, then it, a second quantum effect, namely quantum tunneling through this barrier, takes place at an increased rate because it's near the top of the barrier. And the phase particle begins to slide downhill in the washboard potential producing a macroscopically observable voltage, as I mentioned previously. And here you can see the discrete transitions at effectively different frequencies. This is actually for a different tilts of the washboard, but it's effectively the same. And as Leggett pointed out, it's extremely important that this is an anharmonic potential so that the energy levels are unequally spaced and you evade the correspondence principle. You're able to address the individual transitions and see sharp peaks at different frequencies corresponding to the quantized energy levels. So this was the beginning. It led to the creation now of a whole periodic table of the artificial elements, charge qubits, phase qubits, flux qubits, and other types of qubits. <clears throat> but they're all made of the same three non-dissipative elements. A capacitor, which is a linear circuit element, an inductor, which is a linear circuit element, and the Josephson junction, which is the only non-linear, non-dissipative circuit element that we know of. Hence, every superconducting qubit involves a Josephson junction. Here's the Cooper pair box. It's a small mesoscopic scale piece of superconductor, which has a very small capacitance, so small that if you add a single electron or a single Cooper pair of electrons, it costs a significant amount of energy. You can add and subtract Cooper pairs by tunneling them through this very thin insulating barrier of the Josephson junction. And then to adjust the cost, how much it costs in Coulomb energy to add a pair, you have an adjustable bias voltage here, a gate voltage. And as a function of that gate voltage, you can cause a, a level crossing between the state, which has um, roughly a billion Cooper pairs on the box, and the state that has a billion plus one. And at a certain special bias voltage, those two states are degenerate in energy, and that degeneracy is lifted by the coherent Josephson tunneling back and forth of one single Cooper pair uh, connecting coherence between a billion and a billion plus one pairs. So as you slowly change this bias voltage, the average charge on the, on the island slowly evolves from a billion to a billion plus one. And the, um, the uh, Saclay group in Paris, led by Michel Devoray and Daniel Esteve, uh, it built a single electron transit, um, electrometer, very sensitive to measure this average charge. And here you can see in this curve the smooth transition of the charge uh, one Cooper pair at a time as the voltage is slowly ramped up. Whereas if you had a normal non-superconducting island, there's no coherent tunneling, only incoherent hopping, and there's no coherent broadening of the transition. So this was very strong, but in, uh, indirect evidence that the Cooper pair box was existing in a coherent superposition. This broadening was clearly shown not to be due to temperature, and uh, the only possible source would be the coherent Josephson tunneling. <clears throat> Meanwhile, in Japan, uh, Yasunobu Nakamura and collaborators 
we're doing spectroscopy on the Cooper pair box, shining in microwaves to cause a transition between these quantized energy levels and then using a subsequent complicated process in which Cooper pairs could tunnel and pieces of broken Cooper pairs, Joseph's and quasi-particles, could also tunnel into an external probe, creating a current. And with that, they were able to perform spectroscopy and see directly in the frequency domain the quantized energy levels. My entry in the field came with this paper. I had no idea that there were people thinking about building quantum computers. I knew nothing about the concept of superconducting qubits. I was uh, busy thinking about the fractional quantum Hall effect in those days. And Nakamura and collaborators decided to do an experiment in which they <clears throat> changed the gate voltage, not adiabatically, but as close to instantaneously as they could. This required purchasing a $500,000 pulse generator that could change the voltage in 40 picoseconds. Uh, but because it was, the change was so rapid, the quantum state did not fo smoothly follow the ground state as it would adiabatically, but it stayed in state N uh, but the Hamiltonian now suddenly changed. It was a superposition of the coherent eigenstates and therefore began to evolve in time, as you can see from these ripples in the measured uh, current detecting the state of the qubit. Notice the time scale is picoseconds. These are effectively Rabi oscillations in the language of uh, atomic physics, and they lasted uh, uh, a few nanoseconds, very, very short length of time. But the fact that you could see direct time domain evidence uh, of quantum coherence in a macroscopic electrical circuit was just stunning. And when I saw this paper, I said, it's time to change fields and begin thinking about superconducting qubits. It was really a really exciting moment in my life. At the same time, the Sacle group was busy working with their Cooper pair box and extended it to a new type of qubit, which they dubbed Quantronium. Quantronium uh, is a beautifully designed qubit with special symmetry properties that give it what atomic physicists call a clock transition. There exists a uh, regime of, of gate voltage and magnetic field where the frequency of the transition is insensitive to the precise values of those parameters and therefore unaffected by accidental noise in those parameters. And Michel Deveret and Daniel Esteve and Denis Vion uh, published in 2002 a spectacular experiment showing the first Ramsey interference fringes, which is the acid test of coherence needed to satisfy atomic physicists that this is real, um, real true coherence observed in the time domain. There are a number of technical innovations in this um, qubit. There's a kind of a hybrid charge phase qubit. You wrote in the charge mode and read out in the phase mode and that, or orthogonality of the modes turned out to be useful. There was a latching readout, which they invented to help with the signal to noise. And of course, the main thing was this uh, sweet spot, because now you can see these Ramsey interference fringes going out to microsecond time scales, uh, at least a factor of 100 uh, greater than the initial um, uh, work from uh, Japan. So really exciting and uh, wonderful experiment. Meanwhile, in, uh, in Europe, in Delft, uh, Hans Moy and collaborators were thinking about the, something dual to the charge qubit. Instead of a superposition of a billion and a billion plus one Cooper pairs, you could have a, on an island, you could have a closed loop carrying current, and the current could be in a superposition of going clockwise and counterclockwise, or equivalently, magnetic flux could be tunneling in and out of this loop. 
and they developed this um, proposal for a, a three-junction flux qubit in 1999 and began uh, publishing experiments on it uh, in 2000. Finally, there was the phase qubit. John Martinez went back to his PhD thesis and constructed this tilted washboard potential, but now arranged for the barrier for tunneling out of the lowest two levels to be very large, but tunneling out of the third level to be uh, more rapid. So by, uh, he could manipulate the lowest two levels of the artificial atom and then read it out by applying a tone such that if it were in the excited state, it would go up to the next excited state, tunnel out, and produce a large voltage. This large voltage gave amazingly high readout fidelity of about 85% in a single shot, which was very, very impressive for these early days. But it was uh, later realized that that large voltage spike was destructive of the coherent states of nearby qubits once they began experimenting with more than one qubit, and this method was uh, eventually uh, abandoned for the dispersive readout, which I'll talk about. Um, the qubit in widest use today is the transmon qubit. It's sort of the world's simplest qubit. It just consists of uh, two pieces of aluminum film evaporated on a sapphire substrate, making a dipole antenna about a millimeter long, the two halves are connected by a Josen junction to give you the anharmonic uh, spectrum that you, meet, that you need. So the theory uh, paper uh, led by uh, Jens Koch uh, was soon followed by the first experimental paper led by Andrew Hauck. And the advantage of this, this is basically just a Cooper pair box, but with a large shunting capacitance in the form of this antenna. And this makes it exponentially insensitive to noise in the charge uh, channel at, at the cost of only a modest reduction in the anharmonicity. And the very large dipole moment of this artificial atom, it's about 100,000 times larger than the dipole moment of a natural atom, gives this artificial atom uh, extremely strong coupling to microwave photons, which we will take advantage of. So you can think of this as an artificial atom with atomic number 10 to the 12. There are roughly 10 to the 12 pairs of electrons in here. You might think that the spectrum would then be a nightmare, but at low energies, the spectrum is just that of an anharmonic oscillator. It's even simpler than hydrogen, and it has a comparable quality factor to the Lyman alpha transition in hydrogen. So we're starting to catch up with the natural atoms. There's been orders of magnitude progress in improving the qubit coherence lifetimes uh, over the last 20 years based on new designs, uh, better microwave hygiene, we call it, uh, minimizing the sources of dissipation at microwave frequencies, and better materials. So the coherence times have increased by about six orders of magnitude in recent developments. For example, um, uh, the Maryland group has achieved coherence times north of a millisecond and uh, using improved materials. Uh, this is in the fluxonium qubit. The Princeton group using a transmon but changing some of the materials has a, increased their coherence time to about a third of a millisecond. It's now possible because of all these advances in the field to do very high fidelity two qubit gates that you need for um, quantum computation. Here's just one of many recent examples, some uh, nice progress from Will Oliver's group at MIT doing controlled phase gates in about 60 nanoseconds with a almost three nines fidelity and a I swap gate in 30 nanoseconds, again with almost three nines in fidelity. One of the crucial um, enabling technologies for reading out data and reading out 
error syndromes to do quantum error correction is the development of quantum limited amplifiers, which are, have made tremendous progress, both motivated by the, their need for superconducting qubit circuits, but, but uh, able to be uh, improved dramatically because of the progress in creating superconducting circuits. And uh, so uh, uh, Irfan Siddiqui uh, observed the first quantum jumps in a superconducting artificial atom in 2011. Uh, Zlatko Minev and Michel Devere recently caught a quantum jump in mid-flight and showed to people surprised that it's much more coherent than people realized. And um, uh, Conrad Lehnert at Jilla is uh, supplying amazing uh, amplifiers that do two-mode squeezing to the Haystack uh, dark matter search at Yale, searching for which will accelerate that search for axions. So this kind of technology is assisting both the development of quantum computers and uh, in cosmology. So there are two experiments now in cosmology that use squeezing. One is LIGO, the gravitational wave detector, and the other is this uh, haystack experiment. So that brings us now to the quantum electrodynamics of electrical circuits. QED is the study of atoms and electrons coupled to photons, and the effect of the fact that the electromagnetic field is quantized, that it has zero-point fluctuations, and how that these so-called vacuum fluctuations affect atomic spectra. Cavity QED is, engineers those vacuum fluctuations by putting the atom in, uh, not in free space, but inside some sort of resonator that makes the electromagnetic modes discrete instead of continuous. In the microwave domain, we have the luxury of completely surrounding the, the uh, box by superconducting mirrors that almost perfectly reflect the microwaves. One of the things you can do with this is the Purcell effect. You can choose the cavity frequency to be different than the qubit's frequency at which it would spontaneously fluoresce. And this can enhance the lifetime by a factor of a thousand. A transmon, the large dipole moment of the transmon, transmon qubit means that in free space, it would spontaneously decay by emitting a microwave photon in about 100 nanoseconds. Putting it in a box gives you the 100 microseconds, so a gain of a factor of 1,000. So this is uh, where the story becomes more personal, and I um, uh, got interested in, and moved to Yale and began working with Rob Sholkoff and Michelle Devere, thinking about the quant how to apply ideas from quantum optics and cavity QED to microwave electrical circuits. This was a new field for me. I hadn't studied this in, uh, it took me a couple of years to learn some quantum optics. And the, the, the first thing I learned is that people in atomic physics know much more quantum mechanics than those of us who came from condensed matter theory. So that was very interesting. And, um, we, we had the idea that if you could put an artificial atom in a cavity, you could perhaps see what's called the, the vacuum Rabi splitting, the coherent motion of one excitation coherently going back and forth between the qubit and the um, single photon in the cavity. And I struggled and struggled to figure out exactly how big is the zero point fluctuations of the electric field in, the, in these small resonators. It turns out to be amazingly large. It produces about a microvolt of potential across the qubit. And uh, it turned out to be possible to achieve vacuum Rabi couplings of 100 megahertz. And when I realized that, I realized there was a chance to uh, actually do the experiment. It was still uh, not obvious because in those bad old days, the line widths of these qubits could be 100 megahertz wide due to their short coherence time. Uh, so the theory paper uh, developing this circuit QED, we called it, was led by Alexandre Ble. And then the experiment uh, led by uh, Andreas Valroff, uh, who is a postdoc at 
Yale with Sholkoff and Dave Schuster, a student, soon followed. And uh, one of the things which eventually we were able to do was show that you could go to a strong dispersive limit where the qubit is detuned from the cavity and yet still have such strong dispersive coupling that each time you added a single microwave photon, which has 100,000 times less energy than an optical photon, but despite that, you could see a distinct shift in the frequency of the qubit by of order a thousand line widths. So this is very, very strong coupling, unavailable, completely unavailable with um, natural atoms. That experiment uh, was uh, carried out by, led by Dave Schuster, and uh, theoretical work was done by Jay Gambetta. Later, we, we made uh, these, this work was first done with 2D planar resonators. Later, we moved to these 3D resonators that completely surround the qubit with, um, with superconducting aluminum and produce a much quieter environment. And Honey Pike uh, uh, did the first experiment there, showing the great benefits on the lifetime of the qubit. And later, Matt Regor. Uh, developed some very high Q resonators that could be used for quantum memories. Uh, Andrew Cleland and uh, Martinez uh, at UCSB did a remarkable experiment um, synthesizing arbitrary quantum states in a superconducting resonator um, in uh, Max Hoffheim's uh, lead experiment. Here you see the um, theoretical and experimental Wigner functions, the state tomography for completely non-classical states, such as a superposition of zero and five photons, exhibiting the complete quantum control that's available in this system, which has such strong coupling between the qubits and the harmonic oscillator, the cavity. Here's a picture of the first crude all-electronic quantum processor uh, constructed in 2009 um, using this circuit QED architecture, and it's the first all-electronic processor able to run quantum algorithms. Uh, on, it only had two qubits, but it was able to do the Grover search and deutsch josa algorithms, and uh, all the current industrial systems based on superconducting qubits are really massive engineering scale-ups of this, inspired by this first uh, crude uh, device. And here you see some pictures of some of the current amazing industrial uh, systems with 50 and 60 qubits, uh, Google and IBM. Uh, here's Chad Rigetti, who is a graduate student in our group. And it's uh, wonderful to see the, some of these ideas uh, going out into the world and uh, allowing uh, tremendous engineering advances in the field. I'll mention here just a, a one highlight, which is quantum error correction uh, at or even slightly beyond the break-even point, using not uh, superconducting qubits to hold the information, but rather that hasn't succeeded yet, but rather succeeding by putting the quantum information into these uh, superposition states of different numbers of microwave photons. The first to uh, break the, reach the break-even point is the Schrodinger cat code developed in this theory paper and executed in this experiment uh, in 2016. Uh, more recently, uh, people have made experimental progress at long last on a fascinating uh, code developed by Gottesman, Kataev, and Preskill in 2001, in which the stabilizers, the errors, and the logical gates are all simple displacements of the oscillator in phase space. But it was such an exotic state, quantum state, that it, and no one could imagine that it would be possible to produce. But due to recent progress in superconducting qubits and in trapped ion experiments, there are now two realizations of these states. And here you see 
um, not quite the Wigner function, but the so-called characteristic function, a different kind of to tomogram. And effectively, this is a Schrodinger cat state living in 35 places at once in phase space. So really demonstration of remarkable quantum control of an oscillator. Finally, <clears throat> here's a recent interesting result that got some press from uh, Andreas Walroff, who was uh, on the first uh, circuit QED paper. He has now entangled uh, qubit system separated by five meters using um, a cryogenically cooled waveguide to connect the two uh, qubits in each of these refrigerators and achieved a fidelity of state transfer of about 80%. So this talk has covered a few of the threads in this now exploding field. It's necessarily, I've given you a very incomplete list of topics and key players, and I apologize for leaving many important things out. I'd like to thank my uh, colleagues who've shared some of their slides and thank everyone in the Yale Quantum Institute who have made doing physics uh, and uh, exploring this field so much fun. And I'll close with a picture from 2007 when we first did the two qubit dance and got entangled states in the circuit QED setup. Thank you very much for listening.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the live panel session of QC40. My name is Olivia Lanes of IBM Quantum, and I will be your host for this panel. I hope you enjoyed the historic keynote talks that just aired. I know we had a great time filming them on the Endicott campus. It was a really educational experience for us. I learned so much about the history of that conference and the field as a whole from being there and being able to talk to Peter and Steve and Charlie, as well as Susanna, and getting to hear about the conference you know, firsthand in the years that followed um, was just an invaluable experience which sort of leads us into the topic of this panel. So our morning content celebrated the history of the field and our afternoon sessions will be academic in nature and take a closer look at the recent developments that could have long-term impacts in quantum information. But this panel is mainly to bridge the gap between the past and the future of quantum and to talk about the current state of play. So I am very honored to be able to be here and host the panel and introduce our panelists today, some very prominent names in the field of quantum information. We have Zaira Nazario from IBM Quantum, Isaac Schwang from MIT, Will Oliver from MIT Lincoln Labs, Dorit Aharonov from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and Umesh Vazirani from UC Berkeley. I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves uh, a little bit further in a moment, but for the audience, the way this panel is formatted and structured is to be informal and sort of a roundtable type discussion. I might direct a specific question to a panelist to begin with, but anyone should feel free to jump in and keep the discussion going. Not everyone has to feel like they need to answer every question. So I have prepared some discussion topics to, to get us started, but if you in the audience think you have a great question that would be interesting to bring up, please feel free to post that in the chat. And if time allows, I will definitely get to it. All right, so to begin, I wanted everybody to sort of give us a brief introduction of themselves and also maybe answer the question, how did you first become aware of the field of quantum computing and how did you enter it? So I thought maybe we'd start with you, Zyra, if that's all right. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you um, in the audience and in the um, panel. Um, so I'm a condensed matter theorist by training. My career did not start in quantum computing. Um, in my previous life, I spent really long hours in the company of quantum field theory, um, investigating phase transitions. I've always been fascinated by the renormalization group. I think it's one of the most beautiful things in physics, um, the emergence of scale invariance and universality and, you know, how those systems become insensitive to microscopic details. But uh, that's, that's a completely different topics. Um, I, I also did theory on high temperature superconductivity. And then, you know, life takes you to unexpected places. And I ended up working on science policy at the US Department of State um, in what I thought was going to be just a short, you know, couple of years, um, two years um, pause from research. But later did I know that there were other opportunities awaiting um, working with DARPA in the Department of Defense and IARPA in the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And so I worked there um, on the development and execution of programs to advanced research and development of strategic technologies. And that's how I entered the field of quantum computing. Um, it's been you know, over more than over 11 years um, or so ago. And um, when I, I, I started um, because IARPA, you know, way back um, there asked me to go back to my experience in superconductivity and helped with a program dedicated to advance the coherence in superconducting qubits. And so then from there, you know, I worked on a program to improve the fidelity of multi-qubit operations, and that path led me to quantum error correction. Um, when I joined IBM, I started doing research on error correction and on the physics of qubits and gates. And so it's been like it's been really a fascinating journey, right? A journey of, um, of growth and exploration and discovery. And um, it's been really amazing to be part of the evolution of this field. I, I have to admit, we were talking like you know before. Um, going um, live that, you know, I admit that, you know, way back when I started, I never imagined the growth um, would be so large in, in this period of time. So it's one of those cases where it really feels great to be wrong. Okay, awesome, Zyra. Um, Dora, why don't we go to you next? Because you're next on my screen anyway. Okay, sure. Um, so I'm Dorita Ivanov. I, um, I'm basically, I don't know what my training is because it's some kind of a mixture of physics, computer science, and math. Um, and uh, I basically entered the field of quantum computation uh, by knocking on the, at the, on the door of uh, my advisor, 
uh, looking, I was searching for an advisor for uh, something in, in brain research. And I knocked on his door. That was one year after Shaw's algorithm discovery. And he told me, forget about brain research. Um, here is something very interesting. And he told me about quantum computation. And the truth is that just before I knocked on his door, I actually felt that something is going to happen in my life. And uh, and it did. And um, and uh, so I was very lucky and fortunate to actually uh, him giving me a question which was both very difficult, very interesting and important, as well as uh, tractable. And that was the question of whether one can actually deal with uh, with uh, decoherence and noise in quantum computation. And we both uh, uh, were fortunate to actually, uh, uh, you know, take part in the discovery of, uh, of Fultonov's quantum computation together with uh, other groups. And uh, since then, I've been exploring various directions in quantum computation. It's been really very, very interesting. Um, I think it's one of the most, you know, mind blowing and, and really most exciting uh, directions and, and areas in research that one can be in because it connects philosophy and, and computer science and math and physics in really fundamental ways. And um, and uh, I, I, I really didn't know that these theoretical um, findings um, um, in, so I did cryptography and algorithms and, and so on and so forth. Um, I didn't really know that it will in 20 years become practical. Practical. I never imagined that I will, after 20 years, uh, think of opening a company, which I did. And so I'm now under the hat of two hats, one at the Hebrew University uh, in computer science department, doing uh, quantum computation, leading, uh, working with uh, a wonderful students there, as well as, uh, as working uh, uh, in the Kedma company uh, on quantum computing with uh, Netanel Lindner and uh, Asif Sinai. Um, doing uh, practical stuff about uh, characterization and verification, and both things are really exciting, and it's re it's been really a fascinating journey um, so far. Looking forward. Okay, up next on my screen, I have uh, you, Umesh. Um, hi. Um, yeah, I'm. Uh... I'm a, a professor of uh, theoretical computer science at uh, at UC Berkeley, and um, uh, oops, we can hear you. Uh, sorry, I think I've lost the. Maybe we can still hear you. You you can still hear me. Uh, yep, you're good. I see a frozen screen. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, so. Um, uh, uh, let's see. So I'm I'm also the um, uh, the research director for quantum computing at the Simons Institute. Um, so before I I did quantum computing, I you know I worked on the computational foundations of randomness on uh, on classical algorithms and classical complexity. But um, um, I actually got into quantum computing before there was a field of quantum computing. So um, so that was. Uh, Back in 1991, when there was a there was um, I forget the name, but there was somebody visiting Berkeley who told me about a paper by Feynman, which which at that time was completely forgotten. Uh, you know, this was 10 years after the 1981 conference, and uh, so in, uh, it was not really known in computer science circles. But um, when I read the paper, I, I realized that um, you know. Uh, what it what it suggested was that um, that um, quantum mechanics would uh, would violate this uh, the extended church turing thesis which formed the foundations of computer science and so you know at that time i didn't know any quantum computer uh, quantum mechanics and so uh this this you know this was a dilemma for me but uh, but uh, I, I decided to drop everything i was doing and start learning quantum mechanics. And so I audited a couple of courses the next semester and my student, Ethan Bernstein, took them, you know, those courses and, and we sort of launched full, full force into investigating whether quantum computers violate the extended Schrodinger thesis. And so that was, that was the subject of our paper, you know, a year or so later. And, um, 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 you know, Okay, uh, and um, 
Um, so, so from from my viewpoint, um, you know, I I view I view quantum computing as as you know a really you know a central field in the following sense that what what always attracted me to computer science was was this notion that computation was at the you know at the center of you know it was a way to understand the universe around us you know there was a way to understand science in the in the first place and that there was uh, that you could look through this computational lens and understand various aspects you know you could you could uh, uh, the various sciences and and i think quantum computation is a real embodiment of this this principle Awesome, that's great. I love the quote you said at the beginning when you said I was doing quantum computing before quantum computing was even a field. <laughs> um, Ike, why don't we go to you next? Howdy, folks. Um, my history goes back very much in the spirit of uh, when I was a student and undergraduate at MIT, I couldn't decide what my major should be. And I loved computer science, and I loved electrical engineering, and then I grew a love for physics very unexpectedly. And among all these, one of the things I took inspiration from was Richard Feynman's undergraduate thesis, which I found in the physics reading room at MIT. And so I started reading Richard Feynman's books, and one of my favorite papers was his simulating physics with computers paper, and which uh, Umesh just referenced. And it completely changed my worldview. I started trying to understand the junction between these two fields. And at MIT, we also had Norm Margolis and Tom Toffoli and Ed Fretkin all wandering around. And they were showcasing a wonderful cellular automata machine that Charlie Bennett and, and folks had been involved in at the Laboratory for Computer Science. And, and we were uh, really inspired by understanding the underpinnings of computation at that time. When I went to graduate school, I wanted to continue understanding this junction between physics and computation. And I have to say, nobody in the faculty at Stanford was actually interested in this um, that I could find. And I was fortunate though to be supported by the Hertz Foundation. And so I decided just to do whatever I wanted to do and be crazy and just see what it would take to realize Feynman's dream of building a quantum computer. Uh, fortunately, I found a, a wonderful new faculty member who was open to the idea of being crazy in this direction, who had uh, uh, experience in thinking about quantum optics and quantum computing. And so I started sketching out how I would build Feynman's quantum computer just for the sake of, of thinking about it. And then one day our fax machine started beeping and out came a paper, a preprint about Shor's algorithm. And that forever changed my life. So that's my story. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that story. OK, last but not least, we have uh, you, Will. Great. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm Will Oliver. And uh, I got into this field, I would say, um, starting at the undergraduate level, I was studying superconductivity as an electrical engineer um, with Roman Sobolevsky. And we were, we were working on something called rapid single flux quantum. This was an undergraduate thesis. But it, it, it got me oriented towards superconducting devices and how they may be useful to perform, at that time, just classical computation. And then in, in graduate school, I started as a master's student at MIT. And two things there that I think influenced my direction was I spoke with Terry Orlando at some length about a new idea that he had with Hans Moya Delft, which ended up being the, the flux qubit um, in 1996 and 1997. They had already started thinking about this device. Um, and the second was I took this class from Professor Nihat Berker um, about quantum statistics, and it was just really fascinating. And um, so I decided to switch coasts, and I went to Stanford. And I joined uh, uh, Yoshi Yamamoto's group um, right at the time that Ike was uh, graduating. But fortunately, he didn't go too far. He went to you know, um, I, IBM Almaden just down the street. And so we got to talk more and more. Um, but I feel really fortunate to be in Yoshi's group because um, I was able to study basically quantum optics with electrons and their quantum statistics, which you know, in hindsight had almost no practical application, but allowed me to really think about um, these issues, quantum statistics and quantum mechanics, while interacting with all these 
fantastic people like Ike and Jung Sung Kim and Thaddeus Ladd and Ito and Kaime and Nayoung and Peter and a whole bunch of people who still today are in the field. And 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 in particular, the one the one thing I remember, I don't know if Ike remembers this, but um, you know, we we all had funding from Japan and we would go there occasionally. And so the whole group went to Japan for a, for a meeting. And we had to travel from one place to another. I think it was from Atsugi or NTT Research Labs is to somewhere else. But but Ike and I were riding together, seated next to each other on the bus, and we just spoke for a couple hours um, about liquid state NMR as a quantum computer, and um, you know the pros and cons of doing that. And of course, um, within a few years, many fundamental discoveries and demonstrations uh, were done with that type of quantum computer. But that's that, that's when I really decided that. You know, this is a field I want to get into, and so uh, when I graduated in 2003, I came back to MIT and started studying uh, uh, superconducting qubits uh, with an eye towards, I'd say, extensible uh, implementations and improving these devices to help them, uh, you know, to to get to the point where they are today. And and when we started that effort in 2003, I can say that. Um, superconducting qubits were basically in the other qubits category. It wasn't, you know, the top three or four qubits. Uh, the coherence times were very short. We were just learning how to control them. Um, but of course, they've made a lot of progress since then uh, in the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, yeah, and so today I'm, I'm appointed as a faculty member in EECS and uh, in physics from July and a lab fellow at Lincoln Lab, and I'm the director of the Center for Quantum Engineering at MIT. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Will, and thank you everybody for your introductions and your stories. So um, why don't we just get right into it? So my first question is mostly for my own personal curiosity um, and keeping in the theme of the sort of historic outline of this conference. So the first question is, what has been your favorite discovery over the past four decades in quantum computing since 1981 and why? Uh, and anyone can feel free to, to jump in now. But if not, I'm just going to call on people. So. <laughs> Maybe I'll start. Right. Right. Yeah. Go ahead, Zara. Um, I, I have to say error correction, quantum error correction, for a couple of reasons. Um, the, well, the condensed matter physicists and me is attracted to that theory, right? because in essence, it's a theory of order disorder phase transition at, um, at a critical um, error rate value. And so I, I find that fascinating by itself. Um, but also because of the implications. I mean, without it, um, to me, quantum computation is really a, without it is a cool theory, And but that's about it. And we, we all know, um, like Dorit mentioned, that the, you know, all these quantum mechanical states that are used in the computation are fragile and that their interactions with the environment, um, you know, inevitably lead to errors. Um, I don't know where, where it was that I heard this phrase first, but I like it to describe this. Right, like that anything that is not prohibited is mandatory. So errors are mandatory. And so without error correction, there's no path really to quantum, um, to make quantum computing um, practical. And so that discovery you know, meant the difference between a very cool theory concept and a practical reality. So in that sense, um, it changed everything. And you know, also it, it also continues to be an extremely interesting um, area to investigate. Because if you think about the most popular, you know, error correcting procedures, those really require very large resources. And so there's still a lot of great work um, to be done there um, and work with large impact as we pursue more efficient code. So that's, um, you know, to me, it, it was one of my favorite discoveries. Makes sense to me. I feel like you probably picked a popular one. Is anybody else's favorite? Discovery error correction. Yeah, got to be way up there. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Dort? I feel like maybe you and Zyra sort of align here. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, I was muted. I have to say, I debated a lot about this question. It's a very difficult question. There, there are really several beautiful discoveries. I resort, so error correction was one of them, um, uh, 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 but I resorted to, to something which is not exactly a discovery, but rather an insight, which is um, 
something that uh, uh, it's basically the the what what Umesh and uh, I don't know if it was really written in their paper in the beautiful paper of Umesh and uh, Ethan Bernstein uh, the quantum church Turing thesis. If the name is there, I searched and I didn't find. But uh, but uh, it's this it's this understanding that I think uh, is really the fundamental insight of quantum computation, and it and this is why it's so it has such a large effect on on our understanding of physics and and uh, science and and uh, also the way we do experiments. And I think everywhere that has quantum computation in it affecting. Um, what we see around us is the underlying insight is this um, quantum church Turing thesis, which basically says that that um, that first of all, um, quantum quantum diff very different quantum systems essentially exercise the same type of information processing at their best. If they're really quantum, this is how they do their information processing. So it, there is a, a secret sauce of how they actually evolve the information and every system does it differently, but it all essentially is the same. And this is really a remarkable thing to understand that, that there is something that underlies all of physical systems and ties them all together, um, even though they look so very different. Um, and the fact that this is very different from the way classical physics does it. So to me, this is what underlies um, all the changes that we see because of quantum computation, both the, the fact that quantum algorithms are different from classical algorithms, algorithms in their power, how they're different, we still don't really understand that, as well as the effects on experiments, which will definitely have quantum computing more and more in them, but also because of this, these types of information processing that are essentially quantum. And so this is this understanding that physics is information processing and how it is that way, I think is, is encapsulated in this quantum church theory thesis, which is not a discovery, it's a thesis, not proven. I think that's still definitely valid though. I think that one counts. Um, maybe Will or Ike, would you wanna chime in here on this question too? I have a different take on it because um, I think that what's most interesting about the last 40 years is not necessarily quantum computation, but rather the insights into physics and computation. And so um, I would say that what's most inspirational to me was the very original thoughts of Charlie Bennett and company who showed that quant computation itself could be made reversible and then mapped onto a physical system because physics is is inherently reversible. And so it made consistent two completely set different sets of laws of how information and physical dynamics work. And I, I, I find that inspirational because I think we should look for more of those kinds of bridges between the two fields. So that just as in physics, we say we search for grand unification of quantum and gravity we might also think of grand unification of computer science and physics in a larger way and not just through quantum computation. Yeah, maybe I would add to that, that for me, the, the favorite discovery is not really a sharp discovery, but an ongoing discovery, which is um, the uh, demonstration of macroscopic quantum coherence. I feel that this, this was a real, you know, intellectual, um, development that's happened over the last 30 years or so, um, you know, from the work by John Clark and Michelle Devere and John Martinez in the 80s, when they, you know, demonstrated, you know, combinations of thermal activation and quantum tunneling in basically an LC circuit where the L was a junction and there was a capacitance there. Um, and of course, this circuit had very large numbers of atoms, you know, think Avogadro's numbers of atoms, and yet, um, it was behaving as a discretized quantum system. And I think that in fact was the first flux qubit, although they, you know, the phase qubit as it was called, they didn't name it that at the time, but that became the, the phase qubit that John ended up using uh, through much of the early 2000s. Um, and of course the work at Saclay by Michelle and also Danielle Estev and, and their colleagues uh, leading up to, of course, uh, Yasu Nakamura and Yuli Pashkin and, Josh Hensai's demonstration in 99 of, you know, uh, temporal coherence uh, in a charge qubit. And of course, this 
continues on and on today as we go to larger and larger systems. And this concept that this quantum coherence can extend uh, over large scale systems, even outside the solid state, that we can have um, systems that are separated by you know meters or hundreds of meters. And this quantum uh, coherence remains, even though the number of degrees of freedom in principle are much, much larger, I think is really fantastic. And of course, something that we need if we're going to realize this promise of quantum computing. That's a really great point. Well, yeah, I didn't think of that one originally when I was thinking about this question, but I think that's a really important point, especially when we always talk about what is quantum, because um, it's maybe harder to define than a lot of people think it is. So I think I'm going to move on to the next question, which I actually wanted to direct maybe at you, Umesh, to, to get started, because uh, your name was mentioned quite a couple times during the morning sessions. So this question, um, which is how has the work that you do you do today been influenced by the 1981 conference? And if you have any fun personal anecdotes, feel free to to chime in there with those too. Um, so I, I I would say that um, it was, you know, it was uh, very crucially influenced. Um, you know, I told you the story about coming across Richard Feynman's paper. Maybe I'll elaborate a little bit about that. Um, you know, when when uh, I came across it when there was somebody, I, I forget the name, but uh, there's somebody visiting Berkeley and he, he told me about the paper and he's, you know, uh, he sort of um, gave me a little summary of it. And at, at the time, you know, I was, I was a young faculty member pre-tenure. I, um, you know, I, I heard him and I said, you know, obviously Feynman got it wrong. But then, you know, because, uh, you know, I, I thought he probably misunderstood the probabilistic computation, et cetera. And so I, but then I went and looked up the paper. And to me, it was a most beautiful paper because I, I think this was, you know, this was in those early days when I don't know that, that, um, that, that there were a large number of computer scientists who would have found their way through those computational concepts quite as clearly as, as he did. You know, he, he just managed to find his way through getting the right notions all the way through. It was, it was just a two force. force. Um, now, um, I should say something else about, you know, about what, what that paper did. It really took this conference and set it on its head. You know, um, even though I wasn't there, but, but you know, as, I, as far as I could see, much of the conference was was um, or, or the workshop was uh, was uh, was directed towards studying this this question of whether the inherent reversibility of quantum mechanics posed any barriers to computation. And you know, and the answer obviously was no because of this beautiful work of uh, Landau and Bennett, right, uh, about reversible computation. And what Feynman was doing was. He, he turned it all on the on its head and said, "Not are there any lim further limits that uh, that that uh, th this this nature of quantum mechanics poses on comp computation, but but really, is it possible that you can do much more?" And so there you have to you know you are going towards this these uh, notions of uh, you know th this was this notion of the you know the exponential amount of time it takes to simulate physics, actually. Sometime afterwards, uh, you know, uh, uh, in after after I wrote my paper with uh, Ethan Bernstein, I was visiting IBM, and I had a you know I had a chat with uh, Ralph Landau, and actually we were you know I was in his office and we were talking for about uh, about uh, half an hour an hour and um, you know it, at that time these these concepts were not very you know, uh, the, these did not come very naturally to, to, uh, to physicists. And, and, and so we had a very long discussion about what Feynman actually, you know, what his contributions were. And, um, you know, even though I tried very hard, you know, uh, I, I think I, I could not shake um, Ralph from this, from this viewpoint that, uh, 
Feynman being Feynman just said it a little bit better than everybody else. But, the, but it was basically, you know, that, that, you know, what I saw is this big inversion, you know, that, that Feynman was doing something completely different. And it was this really inspiring, very insightful thing. Uh, you know, I, I think this was, uh, this was a little bit uh, uh, hard, uh, hard to convey. I should also say at that, at that, at that time, you know, I found it, um, I found it very uh, helpful when I was talking to, a, to physicists to make sure that I was talking to at least two at the same time. Because if I spoke to only one, they would, they would usually tell me, it's, you know, sorry, but you got it wrong. You know, here's the, here's the reason why you can actually simulate uh, quantum mechanics. We know, how, we know that a D-dimensional quantum system can be simulated by a D plus one dimensional classical system, you know, et cetera. And, I didn't know enough quantum mechanics to, you know, to tell them no, that's not correct because of this and so on. And so, so I found it very helpful to talk to two at the same time because when one of them would say something like this, the other would 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 then chime in and say, no, no, you're wrong because of X, Y, Z. And so it was just safer to be in a crowd than in, you know than with a single one. <laughs> Thanks, Yumesh. <laughs> That's a super funny story. Um, yeah, I, I don't know who wants to maybe chime in next, but yeah, does anyone else want to talk about a story about how their work was uh, enabled from this conference, maybe even subconsciously? Dorit, right, I think you're muted again. I'm just, I'm just saying that there's there's so much to say that there is nothing to say. Like there's, <laughs> we, we wouldn't have been here without this, without this, uh, this, uh, the, the fruits that came out of this conference. Um, I think, I think it's, uh, it's sort of obvious that, that, that someone had to actually say, uh, make this connection that quantum computation, that quantum physics can be viewed from the information processing point of view as computation. Um, and it came from it came from there. Yeah, actually, that leads really well into my next question. So um, maybe maybe you want to jump into that one instead. My next question is basically in this theme of the conference, like you were saying, the idea that you can combine computing and information theory and physics. What was maybe the most surprising revelation to you about how physics and information interact that you've learned about through the course of your work? This is a question for everyone? It's for everyone, yeah. But since you started talking about it, I was going to ask you first. OK. Well, to me, this is a, just a, a remarkable thing. It's like, I mean, it's often the case that they're very, very different entities that somehow reflect each each other, reflect one another. And, uh, and this is, and it's mind boggling, as well as very relaxing to see this connection. And it's it's this in in this case it's math and the essence the the abstract way of looking at what happens and physics which is its manifestation and it's it's amazing to to see that the two go together nothing actually says that they should be going together um, so to me it's both mind boggling and uh, uh, an amazing source of of uh, of uh, of questions and fundamental questions to see this connection. I think one of the most inspiring connections is what Zaira pointed out at the beginning. Error correction is a big surprise to physics. But let me also bring us back to the mindset of physics of computation in 1981. Remember, this was not a meeting of quantum computation. It was not a meeting of quantum physicists and computation. It was a meeting of physicists and computation. And, and that was the case because people did not know what the future of computation would take as its embodiment, whether it was going to be silicon or superconductors or something else. So there are many other threads that also came out of his comp 1981, including DNA computing, biological computing, other kinds of computational models. And I think in many ways, that's one of the most important legacies of that time. The, the willingness to revisit the foundations of computation and how those are mapped onto physical systems. Umesh, what do you think about that? 
Well, I, uh, no, I, I would agree, but and and um, I, I was going to say that um, that um, you know, in in a sense, this uh, you know, this was a great investigation, but and and um, it led to something well beyond what anybody could have imagined, which was which was a redefinition or reimagining of of a bit of information. You know, the the very basic notion. Of a, of a bit, you know, the, the uh, um, as in, in terms of a qubit, right? So this is what it eventually led to. But the fact, the fact that, um, you know, something so foundational had to be reimagined uh, to be consistent with physical reality, you know, the, this was something that was completely, um, you know, it, it would have been un unimaginable at that time. And you know, this is why when when I first heard about Feynman's paper, I, I really thought it's obviously wrong. You know, it it contradicts the foundations of our field. You know, it's um, there's obviously a misunderstanding. So it took a really long time to unpack all that. I would um, I I agree with everything that that you guys have said, um, and I'll echo. Um, Dorit and and Umesh, right? Uh, Landau, the Landauer principle. I like that the moment that I read it. Uh, the fact that um, you know, erasure of information is necessarily a dissipative process, and um, and moreover, how that is a consequence of the second law of thermodynamics. And I mean, like think about it, right? Like it's connecting erasing a bit with reduction of entropy, and and that like you know that heat flows to the environment. Uh, to me, that was it's it's, it's Magical, it's fascinating. It's, it's, uh, because as Dorit says, um, we often think of information in, as this abstract thing, and here's physics and it's dictating you, you know, here's how you manipulate information. Um, and then we realize that uh, we should think physically about computation. And that when, when we do that, like Umesh said, suddenly there's a new paradigm of computation that emerges in front of us um, and is there for, for exploration. So that our principle for me. It's also, I think, it's also, I think, fascinating not only in, in what it contributes to computation, but also in, I think it really changes the way we think about physics because of these connections between very, very different systems. And these connections are through information. So it just, it, it basically gives a different perspective and different conceptual way to view physical behavior. Which is, I think, no less of an impact on the on our understanding of scientific on the of the scientific world than than computation. Like black holes. Today we think about black holes completely differently because of the theory of error correction. Okay, great. Um, that was a great discussion. I think I'm going to direct my next question to you, Will. Um, and I'm very interested to see what you would say. So in your opinion, what is the most important questions that people should be asking regarding computation, physics, and engineering and quantum um, over the next couple of years? Well, there, there are probably many, and I, let, let me just give one response, and I'd be curious to hear what others on the panels think. But if I, if I think about the promise of quantum computing, of course, um, there's a lot of impact on how we think about quantum mechanics and, of course, how we will end up teaching um, quantum mechanics and quantum engineering going forward. So, so I won't talk about that. I think that those are all points that we should be thinking about in the coming years. But from a very practical standpoint, if quantum computing is going to become a reality, such that we can realize this promise that we, we, we think about. Um, I think that what we have to do is focus on uh, real problems and how we might address those real problems with quantum algorithms, both the ones that we know about today and also ones that we have yet to discover. And, and, and that's important because, you know, it, this, this field is a beautiful academic endeavor but of course, there's also um, a practical side to it. And uh, whether we're thinking about the NISC era, um, as John Preskill has called it, 
where we don't yet have error correction, but we really would like to do something useful with these machines, or in the beyond NISC era, the error corrected uh, universal computation era. I think you know focusing on developing real world applications for quantum computers and quantum algorithms um, is an important direction to go, and and maybe simply for the reason that it's it's very difficult at least for me, to um, address abstract problems. So if, if I'm trying to think of just a new, let's say, uh, quantum algorithm in the abstract without a particular application in mind, I find that to be very difficult. And I, I think that when focusing on a real, a real world problem that maybe an industry has or humanity has, um, and thinking about all of the details that go into that in mapping an existing algorithm onto that or developing a new one, it reveals so many details that we just don't generally wouldn't see in the in the abstract, but we come face to face to them with them uh, when we when we try to tackle this real world problem that I think that that would in turn benefit and push forward uh, the field um, in parallel with all the other things I said at the beginning. I'd like to build on what Will just said, because I think it's very important to highlight his his uh, thought and tenor and direction, which is, and I'll be sharper, quantum computing today is actually, from a practical standpoint, quite useless, other than in generating publicity like this event. Now, I, I'm being rather um, sharp about that, because one of the things we want to make sure does not happen is that this field plummets and becomes uh, the, the, the consequence of its own overpopularity and overhype state, because we want to make sure that this field lives on. There's something foundational that's really changing how we view computer science and physics. That might not happen for a long time. And yet we also believe that there may be something practical that is a consequence of it, but that's not actually here yet. It's not terribly useful from any economic reality sense today uh, what quantum computing can deliver, but there's a great deal of hope. And let's keep that clearly in mind and, and, and not, uh, not, not um, overbelieve in our own field and what this is saying. Actually, uh, I sh I should, I'd like to add to that and say, you know, when I'm, uh, many years ago, one of my our computer architecture colleagues uh, said to me um, that that the that the biggest application of computers was designing better computers. <laughs> you know, the most important application. And I think uh, quantum computers are at an even earlier stage than classical computers were at that time. And I think uh, moving forward, uh, uh, the way I would see it is that re that really holds for quantum computers. That the that 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 the biggest uh, application I would see moving forward is is the benchmarking of them and learning more about how to build better quantum computers. Uh, you know, as as we move along in the in the near future. I think that. Um... On that topic of uh, the problems that quantum computers, you know, could could solve and all the hype we're seeing and all that, um, the, like people, it should go without saying. But I feel like you know we we should keep reminding that people must must never forget to ask if they're when they're considering problems um, to address with quantum computing, what in the formulation of that problem or the algorithm has to do with quantum mechanical effects. Um, I think that's that's important to always continue to keep in mind. And um, from the standpoint of uh, developing those, right? Like I, I would say, um, how do we exploit those quantum effects to build better circuits? And um, how can we optimize those circuits um, to you know reduce um, as much of the um, overhead as possible while maintaining as much of the essence as possible? And uh, yeah. How can we do that by trading off quantum and classical resources? And how do we do that? And then maybe from the hardware challenges, I, I think that um, we should be thinking more about integration technologies, about novel packaging, um, you know, things that allow us to scale while maintaining or increasing the coherence and the gate fidelities. And what, uh, you know, 
what what does it take um you know if if we're going to continue to um you know progress in these um you know to connect chips and distribute entanglement and, uh, among those chips things like that um, uh, besides what i mentioned at the beginning right of error correction and, and how to reduce the resources there those are a few um, questions that i see important um, in the next few years i want to i want to add to things that were said here um People are really, really interested in, in trying to find algorithms that will, will show benefit, it will show quantum advantage in the NISC era, which is great. I mean, it's, it's really an amazing playground and really very interesting question and, and important. But we have to still remember that we really understand very little about what quantum computation can do beyond the NISC era. Um, and Personally, I think that it has to do with belief. I think that at this point, um, mathematicians and computer scientists, a majority of them don't really believe that the right model of computation is, is quantum mechanics. And, and maybe in 10 years, um, many more people will, will believe that. And then there will be many more you know, people playing around with those things. And at that point, I'm sure that new ideas of quantum algorithms will come up, which we are not imagining at this point, about fault on quantum computation. Um, and sewing the, seeing the, the line towards that time, I don't I cannot see, but I'm I, I think yeah. that this uh, this will happen. I, I echo the Reed's message and want to encourage young people in this field to um, consider going in directions which are not popular, because that's what made quantum computing successful in the early days, doing quantum computing before quantum computing was quantum computing. So do some other kind of computing, physics of computation today, that um, pursues Dorit's challenge to you and figures out a model of computation that is real, that is useful, that people can believe in as, as computer scientists. And it might not be quantum, it might be biological, it might be about the brain, it might be about neurons, it might be something at this junction of machine learning and the physical world. I, I think that there's a lot to learn here for how computation maps onto physical systems and vice versa that we simply have not uncovered yet. And I would do something that's not popular. Um, let, let me let me add to what uh, the rate and Ike said uh, also. Uh, so I I think that um, you know it's clear that they that that there are that there are hardware challenges ahead, but I, I think that there are you know, there's there's just a lot to be discovered. I I believe that there's a lot to be discovered on the theory side, that we are we are not even you know part of the way there in terms of meeting all you know all these challenges, and that um, um, I I think that um, um, you know that this this next period we are going to we are going to discover a lot more uh, you know in not just in terms of algorithms but also in terms of what what are the right models and you know. And, and in terms of fault tolerance, etc., there's a there's a lot more to be to be done before. Just e even if we were so so already to address the question of practical quantum computing, I think there's a lot more theory that needs to be discovered. But then beyond that, there's there's this uh, you know there are the connections between you know between quantum computation and physics. You know just in terms of understanding physics. You know, through the computational lens, I think that process has only just started, and there's a there's a lot more to be discovered there. Yeah, you can sort of see the waves starting and really not reaching. We have a very long way to go within physics. That was a great discussion. I don't want to uh, intrude too much. We have 10 minutes left, and I want to make sure we get to at least a few questions from the audience if we can. And I apologize in advance. There's simply no way we have time to get to all of them. We've had a lot of great questions come in. Um, there's one I can answer. A lot of people are asking for a great resource to get started if you're a beginner. Or maybe I can answer this as well. I know of this one really great textbook. Um, it's called The <laughs> Quantum Computation and Quantum Information um, by... Uh, Isaac Schwang and Michael Nielsen. I think that that would be a great textbook to get started with. But the question that I wanted to direct for, for you, the panelists, um, the first audience question is, what is the biggest hurdle that you have faced in your careers? 
and what did you do to sort of overcome it? And maybe I'll point that one um, to you, Ike, first, since I sort of called you out at the beginning. Oh, um, when we are, you are doing something completely new, nobody believes in what you're doing and or the value of it, especially if you're doing something in between two fields. You know, it's very unusual to uh, be stuck in a crack where the physicists say you are a computer scientist and the computer scientists say you are a physicist and they dismiss you with that. Uh, and so uh, I, 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 I suffered through this and uh, I was told there is no recourse but to be the best at both. And that's a, that's a tall challenge. I think all new fields suffer through this and we are going through that right now. But um, one of the nice things about the current state is that there are quantum information scientists who can help new people in the field um, in this kind of a crack. But if you're going to take my advice and do something unpopular, you're going to be stuck in this kind of a limbo and you better get to enjoy it. Will, do you want to maybe go next? The question again. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, indeed. I, I, I agree with Ike. Um, I think the biggest hurdles I faced and, you know, without going into detail, but basically surrounds, you know, having an idea that you want to pursue um, and, you know, where it straddles different fields, it's it's not conventional, it's, you know, it isn't supported by, you know, tens of billions of dollars of investment or trillions of dollars of investment. And, and then you need to stand that up and do it. And um, it's it has to be a labor of love. And um, so I guess, you know, as, as I said, I think I would encourage new students and younger researchers to, you know, forge out and be bold and, and do something that you really are passionate about. Because, you know, the ideal career trajectory we always think of is this, you know, monotonically increasing uh, line. But of course, that's not really what happens is that, uh, of course, it goes up and down and you meet challenges all the time. But if you're doing something that you love and you're passionate about and, and you know that it will make a difference, then um, you'll be able to smooth out those bumps and, and, and achieve your goals. Dora, you look like you want to chime in here too. I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of hesitating whether. So, uh, <laughs> um, so if I'm allowed to be honest, um, the, I think the biggest hurdle for me was, um, so, in my PhD, uh, uh, we discovered me and my my advisor Michael Benor, we discovered the full tolerance theorem, and that was a really, really big thing. Um, um, and after that, I felt that, I mean, I didn't know how to proceed because, because what can be done, I mean, that was really a, an, a really important thing. I didn't feel that, you know, it's a thing. It's, I don't feel it's mine. It's, it's just a thing of nature that we happen to discover um, and together with two other groups. But, but after that, where would I go? So I was really afraid. I was really afraid to sort of let go of this and go to other directions. And I tried to go to other directions, but sort of like, like someone who's climbing on a hill, but clinging with all his body or her body to the hill instead of, you know, walking freely. And it took me a long, long time to, to let go and, and sort of be okay with, with doing things that are, you know, will, will not, maybe, maybe this will completely fail that direction or that direction or, or won't be interesting. And, so for me, that was, I wouldn't say, I mean, there are many hurdles as a scientist, but that was a big hurdle for me. Yeah, I think that's yeah. great to point out. And I think it's, you know, important for a lot of people who maybe are getting started in their careers to understand that, you know, we've all probably pursued projects that haven't panned out at some point or another. And that's just part of the process. I mean, not everything that you that you cling to or that you initially think is going to be a great idea actually is. And that's just how that's just how science works sometimes. Indeed. Um, yeah. Uh, Zaira Umesh, I want to make sure I give you guys an opportunity to answer if you'd like. The one that I'll find tomorrow. <laughs> I'm serious about these. There's one after <laughs> the other. Um, yeah, I, there, there are many, um, but I, I think um, I touched on an important one, and it's that fight against being like put in a box. Um, 
and yeah, growing from there. I think that that is a, that is a, a a big one. I will say one that is unconventional, um, because I don't you know not many people experience that. But um, like uh, Will said, not all careers like are you know linear, and I have one that had as that was as non-linear as possible, um, if you will. And um, being away from research for a number of years, you are kind of like trained to believe that um, once you're away for a while, you can't go back. And it was scary to decide to go back. Um, but I can say that that is not true. You can totally go back and continue. It's like, you know, it's like um, riding a bicycle. You, you might be rusty for a little bit, but you never forget it. Um, So, um, let's see, I, you know, I, I would say that, um, in, you know, in the early years, um, one thing that I found very difficult to do was, um, was to, um, you know, was to encourage my students to go into the field because it was not clear to me what they would do afterwards. And so I could see, you know, throwing my career down the drain, but I couldn't see myself <laughs> encouraging my students to do the same thing. Um, actually, it's, you know, one thing I remember is that, um, is that um, this is not quite a, quite in the, in the, you know, a hurdle, but, um, uh, but I believe it was in 1993 at the Overwork uh, workshop, you know, I, I spoke about, um, you know, about my work with Ethan Bernstein, and then uh, uh, afterwards, uh, um, uh, you know, later that afternoon, um, I, I ran into Arnold Sh uh, 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 Sean Hage, who's um, who was one of the you know giants in the field uh, in 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 classical algorithms and complexity, and he came up to me and he said. Why did you have to do that? You know, we had such a nice theory. Why did you have to? Why did you have to do this? You know, it was, you know, it was just this feeling. You know, you know, the, you know, this was this was just introducing something. So, uh, you know, uh, it was taking something nice and beautiful and and spoiling it. And and I think that was. You know, he just, he said it uh, very very clearly, but I think there were many others who possibly felt, you know, um, in in computer science, you know, do we really need all these complications? And you know, weren't we weren't we great where we were? All right, we only have three minutes left. I have one more question, but we have to be very quick about how we answer it. So I'm going to ask this one question, and then I need probably like a few word answers from anybody, but uh, there's probably not a whole lot of time to elaborate. So my last question, which is also an audience question as well, is, you know, 40 years, probably too hard to predict what's going to happen, right? But what about in the next 10 years? What is the discovery that you are most excited to see? If you could just sum it up in a few words, maybe I'll start with, um, with you, Will. Yeah, sure. Well, not really a discovery, but I would look forward in the next 10 years to a concrete demonstration of quantum error correction. That's mine as well. Uh, error correction. I want to see error correction being used in non-trivial non quantum circuits. Ike, you want to answer next? I want to see something in physics and computation outside of quantum computation. For example, the ability to um, design a seed, which you plant, and then becomes your computer. OK, awesome. Um, Umesh? Um, I, would, I would like to see um, you know, uh, even bigger consequences of, of uh, quantum computing in terms of understanding physics. You know, I, for, for example, if uh, you know, if if through ideas out of quantum information, quantum computing, we understood quantum gravity, you know, resolve that, or uh, you know, uh, that there were other such consequences in terms of understanding something something new. And I, I would actually also like to say that sometimes these work in in both directions, right? That 
that you understand something new there, but you also understand something new, fundamentally new about about computation. So that's what I would I would like to really see. Great. And Dort, I'll give you the uh, very last word here. I I don't really. I mean, other than what people said, I don't really have something special to say. I really would like to see something that I cannot imagine now. I want to see some mm -hmm. new algorithm that I cannot imagine now. And another thing I really want to see is a theory of multipartite entanglement. I want to understand, mm -hmm. this is to me the most mind-boggling part of quantum mechanics, the many-body interactions that are, that are the multipartite entanglement, and we, so, we're so far from understanding it. So I, I want to see myself understanding it. Awesome. Yeah, you answered the question the exact same way that I always answer the same question. I always say I want to see something that nobody's even talking about yet. I think that would be the coolest demonstration. Um, so we are very short on time here now, so I think we need to wrap up. But I just want to sincerely thank all of our panelists for being here with us today and giving us so much of their time. I think this was a really enlightening and a great discussion, and it was important to commemorate this event. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing, you know, what's going to happen in the next few years. And so thank you guys so much again for your participation. And to the audience, um, up next, we have IBM Quantum's own Jerry Chow, who's going to be taking it away and talking about the future of quantum hardware. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jerry Chow, and I'm Director of Quantum Hardware System Development at IBM Quantum. And I'm so excited to be here today to celebrate this 40th anniversary of a momentous occasion in quantum computing. And I wonder, what is the next 40 years going to bring in quantum computing? And what I'd like to share today is really our perspective of what might happen, especially from a quantum hardware point of view. Now, looking back at the history of computing, it's really exciting to see the types of progress that has really enabled computation. And f for that matter, what's really exciting, though, at this current moment in time is that we're actually in the first point in history where computing has actually branched, in that we've seen the progression according to Moore's law as we have progressed classical com computing over the many years, in including increasing the number of transistors on a device. But really, with quantum computing, we have a split. We now have classical computing continuing on its path. And on top of that, we have a different form of computation, quantum computation, with its own roadmap, with its own set of developments, and its own future looking ahead. And really, the moment in time where that split, I would say, occurred, happened a few years ago, 2016, in May 2016. In May of 2016, we launched the IBM Quantum Experience. And at the time, it was the first cloud-accessible quantum computer. It was just five qubits at the time. But it was opened up an entirely new world for users all around the world to start to actually get access to real quantum hardware over the cloud. This made a big difference in terms of not needing to have uh, a world-class laboratory where you're running dilution refrigerators or, or uh, fancy electronics, and instead you could just use a quantum computer from the comfort of your own home in a browser. And since that time, though, we've really we've really pushed the envelope in terms of the types of systems that we can we can deploy. A few years ago, we launched IBM Quantum System One, which is a quantum computer that can be basically placed anywhere. And in order to do this, was there a lot of engineering that had to be done understanding the underlying core hardware elements that allow us to have stable, continuous operation. Now, having the ability to access quantum systems and actually exploit them is a huge part of what we see moving forward and how we want to actually drive a future with quantum computation. So the future of computation is really intimately tied with quantum computers as well. And the future of quantum computing is tied to having these valuable quantum circuits. Quantum circuits are what is going to provide a differential over traditional computing. And what we want to be able to do is have hardware and have systems available in order to test and run everly increasing larger numbers of quantum circuits. And we're seeing that today. 
in fact, an exponentially increasing number of quantum circuits are being run on the systems that we host over the cloud already. Now, looking forward, clients are going to look to capitalize on these quantum circuits to bring applications to life to actually show quantum advantage. And different forms of quantum circuits which power the computation will allow for different types of applications to be explored that are relevant for uh, exploring on quantum computers, such as simulating quantum mechanics, which has impact on understanding materials and chemistry, understanding al certain algebraic problems, such as in machine learning and uh, solving differential equations, and search problems, including understanding how to perform optimization using a quantum computer. Now, all of this, though, is really built upon a foundation of hardware. And quantum hardware involves a lot of research and development. IBM has been involved in quantum hardware, in fact, for the last 20 years. And we have a really rich history there uh, upon which we've been able to get to the point we are today. Back in the early 2000s, we actually worked on a different form of quantum computing using liquid state NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. And some of these seminal experiments were performed by IBM fellow Matthias Steffen out in the Almaden Research Lab in San Jose. Now at the time, these liquid state NMR types of quantum computers were not scalable. But nonetheless, we were already able to demonstrate five to seven qubit algorithms, including initial demonstration of Shor's algorithms as well as Gro Grover's algorithm. Then in the mid-2000s, there was a lot of work that was done in the field of circuit quantum electrodynamics with superconducting qubits. Now, what's interesting here is a lot of this work was, was pioneered at Yale University. And a large number of the current team that's at IBM had their start, in fact, in their PhDs and, and postdoc careers at the Yale University, driving a lot of that work there. But what was fundamental at that time was really to build up the initial demonstrations of what can be done using superconducting qubits, from understanding their properties to de de driving coupling and demonstrating the first types of multi-qubit gates. Then in the early 2010s, we we were able to transition towards actually having quantum processors here at IBM using superconducting qubit technology. Over that time, a lot of the work went down into improving processor quality. How can we actually get coherence times in a processor that can start to demonstrate algorithms and multi-qubit gates? How can we actually reduce some of the errors that are involved with the packaging of the system so that we can actually make devices reliable and usable over time? That really led to 2016, which was when we launched IBM Quantum Experience, and really pushing systems now onto the cloud, stable enough and reliable so that they can be accessible anywhere. Now, along with that hardware roadmap in the past, we really see a, a technological development of the actual underlying quantum processors themselves. What we've seen uh, has been an increase in the number of qubits, and also the types of technologies that go into making those qubits function. And so it's interesting to look at our progression of quantum processors visually, looking back starting in 2011 when we had a two qubit device, then three qubits, then four qubits, up to the five qubit device that we were actually able to stable, keep stable and launch on the cloud in, in 2016 for the quantum experience that we actually have named the Canary family of processors. Uh, but subsequently, we then scaled that up to 16 qubits, also launched onto the cloud. And then most recently, our Falcon and Hummingbird processors at 27 qubits and 65 qubits, respectively. What you see here is really the progression of various technological elements to allow this scaling. And along with that scaling is also an improvement of the underlying operation and stability of the systems. Looking back at the last 10 years of hardware progress really also sets the stage for us looking forward. And that's why last fall we released our quantum hardware development roadmap, really showing how we are imagining the next few years of hardware development, pushing the envelope in terms of the numbers of qubits that we were going to have. In fact, by 2023, we expect to have over 1,000 qubits in our Condor processor. Now, along this hardware roadmap, though, What's really key is that with every one of the, the birds, of every one of the processors and families that we're defining, there's a technological development that is associated with it, which enables it. 
And a big part of how we do hardware development is that a lot of these different technological elements all happen in parallel, some of them with different timelines for completion. All the way to the point that even for planning beyond 1,000 qubits towards a million qubits, we're already starting to think about what are the, some of the elements that are necessary there. Now, how we actually drive progress in hardware is really going to be paired with how do we actually drive progress in measurable quality of the systems. And in fact, in order to have useful quantum computers that can actually run quantum circuits of value, we're really boiling it down into three dimensions of improvements. There's the quality angle, where effectively we want to be able to have systems of high enough quality with low enough error rates so that the circuits you want to run can run effectively. Then there's the idea of capacity. When we want to actually run certain applications and algorithms, you're going to need to run many, many quantum circuits. And it's critical to be able to get those quantum circuits in and out of the quantum computer at a fast rate. And so having a large capacity and the ability to actually have a tight integration between the quantum hardware and the classical hardware is going to be critical for processing that information at a large clip to explore more difficult uh, applications and algorithms. And a third element is what we call variety. As we want to explore quantum circuits, there's a wider range of quantum circuits that get enabled through having a more tight integration and feedback between the classical computer and the quantum computer. For example, there's the ability to actually measure a, a set of qubits in the middle of a quantum circuit, feed that information forward to influence the next set of classical operations that you might apply to the quantum circuit. And this type of operation is really the basis for a larger variety of circuits such as phase iterative phase estimation that, are, that really come into play for certain types of applications, especially in error correction. And so really what we're looking to do is drive along all three of these dimensions, quality, capacity, and variety. And where hardware really comes into play is how we are pace setting on the quality front. One measure that we use to drive quality uh, and to measure our, our progress in quality is called quantum volume. Now, quantum volume is meant to represent the largest square-shaped quantum circuit that you can run in your hardware. And it's really a metric that's designed to uh, be kind of hard on the, uh, on, on the actual underlying hardware. Uh, but it, with respect to quantum volume, we've been committed to doubling this quantum volume year after year. Uh, and we're really pace setting that. Last year, we actually were able to double that multiple times. In fact, reaching a quantum volume of 128 on our Montreal backend. And what we really want to get to is that as we continue to improve the underlying hardware, we're going to continue to scale up on quantum volume. But at some point, some of the concepts of quantum error correction are going to actually play a difference. And when those elements of quantum error correction allow us to not only scale based off of making hardware improvements, but actually scale quantum volume through, have, through encoding and using software uh, error correction to really help, help, help bring down noise and errors further, we expect to see an inflection point in quality and an inflection point in how quantum volume will continue to scale. Now, currently, as I've said, the Montreal backend is the state of the art, hitting a quantum volume of 128. And it has a very, very excellent set of specifications at the device level, including coherence times and two qubit gate fidelities. And just to give you a flavor of all the types of work that go into improving these devices and actually making them give accurate benchmarks, uh, when it came to quantum volume 64, a, 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 quite a number of elements went into that. To demonstrate quantum volume 64 on the system, we had to improve elements of the actual software compilation of the circuits onto the system, onto the physical hardware that we had. We had to actually uh, alter the way we applied the two qubit gates, find better ways and schemes to make the two qubit, two -qubit gates shorter. We were able to actually use interesting techniques for uh, improving the underlying readout of the system. And that all really put together allowed us to drive towards quantum volume of 64. 
Interestingly enough, a lot of the underlying hardware parameters of the actual quantum processor for Montreal were already good enough to even hit quantum volume 128. And in fact, we did that by further tweaking the readout a little bit and also improving the underlying compiler. On the same set of hardware, we were able to push the envelope to 128 last, uh, late last fall. Now, looking back at the roadmap, with each one of these next generation of processors, we want to see those technological uh, improvements feed in. And in the fall, we actually quietly released our Hummingbird processor. And this Hummingbird processor has 65 qubits. Uh, one of the back ends that are available online is called Manhattan. Uh, and what's interesting about the Hummingbird processor is that we were able to leverage a lot of the knowledge that we had in Falcon, which was the Montreal system, but right into this larger uh, processor. And, and uh, let me give you one example of how some of that learning translated directly into improved quality of performance. Often, one measure of, besides quantum volume, of quality of, this, of, a, of a particular processor is to ask, what is the largest entangled state that you can actually support on a, on a uh, quantum device? Uh, and for that matter, uh, having entanglement, you can think of as, as really having a resource for more complex quantum uh, computations for more complex quantum circuits uh, in the long run. And, and so having a good measure of a large number of qubits entangled is, is, is quite, a, quite, a, quite an important feat. Um, we explored, in fact, on a various number of systems, what is the largest entangled state that you can have. And this is actively looked at across a large variety of quantum processors out there, including different technologies such as ions and, uh, ions and, and, and semiconductor qubits. Um, we had actually demonstrated an 18 qubit uh, entangled state on our Johannesburg backend a few years ago. And then one of our IBM Quantum Network Hub members uh, from the University of Melbourne were, were actually able to use that same Montreal device and they found a technique that allowed to, them to actually entangle all 27 qubits on the Montreal device. Now, interestingly enough then, once we released Hummingbird last fall, uh, Man the Manhattan uh, backend, they basically used those similar techniques of entangling the, the 27 qubit device and found that, lo and behold, they could, in fact, entangle all 65 qubits on uh, Manhattan as well. And so to that end, this really is the largest uh, entangled state on a programmable quantum computer that's been uh, done so far. Now, back to the underlying hardware and all those technologies that come into play. Uh, with respect to uh, driving beyond Hummingbird, uh, this year we plan to release our Eagle processor and that's going to clock in at 127 qubits. Some of the work that that goes into the technology to enable that is uh, it really involves increasing the total number of inputs and outputs that can actually uh, serve the, the, the qubits on the chip. Uh, this includes using new technologies like through silicon vias and multi-level wiring. Now, What's interesting about this is that we're really excited about the progress along this front because this technology is starting to work and really, um, uh, really coming together. In fact, here's an actual picture of what this multi-level wiring looks like. Effectively, what we're doing is we're trying to have different layers within a silicon interposer to allow us to bring a larger number of signals in. And here's a cross-sectional view which shows all these different metal layers and uh, how these types of interposers uh, actually look uh, uh, along, along a, a planar cut. Um, now, the real devil in the details is, does this actually work with, with qubits? And fortunately, we, we actually have a, uh, a, a, a separate project, which is on six qubits using this type of multi-level wiring that is already working very well in the laboratory. Uh, in fact, in this type of six qubit ring architecture, which uses the multi-level wiring, we measured all the coherence times, the two qubit gate fidelities, and they all are in line with about the, the similar performance of our multi-qubit uh, devices such as Falcon and Hummingbird already. So this really gives us a lot of confidence in the Eagle platform and looking ahead for our, our 127 qubit uh, processor later this year. Now, Going beyond that 100 qubit and 400 qubit level, which was Eagle and an Osprey, uh, we can already start to think about what will it take to go beyond 1,000. 
And this 1,000 target we have uh, very aggressively for 2023, uh, which will be our Condor platform. Uh, but a big part of that is not just how do we actually physically construct the thing and, and actually cool it down in our dilution refrigerators and bring all the wires, but how do we do that and also have stellar performance, very, very low gate errors. Today, most of our gate errors at best are around 1 to 2 times 10 to the minus 3. And we want to bring that down even further to 1 times 10 to the minus 4. And a big part of that is ongoing research to explore how do we couple the various superconducting qubits? Are there ways that we can use novel ideas of interference to actually bring down some of the crosstalk noise? And we have a number of ongoing efforts on our team right now at the same time as constructing all these different elements to build the processor, but to understand how to perform better and higher performance two qubit gates. And for that matter, we're, there's, there's the exploration of something known as the resonator-induced phase gate, uh, which actually uses uh, microwave photons and a degree of freedom of a cavity coupling multiple qubits to, uh, to give a two qubit gate, uh, as well as a number of cancellation ideas where we have multiple quantum buses that allow us to have the ability to use interference to remove some of the crosstalk elements uh, of the, of that, that, might, that might cause errors in the system. Uh, and then we're also looking at bringing back ideas of having tunable microwave couplers, sorry, tunable magnetic couplers that allow us to actually uh, change dynamically uh, the coupling between, uh, between fixed, fixed frequency qubits. Altogether, we're really excited about a lot of the work in the alternative gate area in order to really give us the potential to bring down the gate errors even further as we scale up to Condor. Looking further into that development roadmap, there's also a, a, the story beyond 1,000. And really, what, we're, what we want to get to eventually is a million and over a million qubits. And even just fathoming what it takes to get there is, is, uh, is, is quite a feat. For one, we need to actually envision how do we actually bring down the qubit footprint? How can we get a scalable set of cryogenic controls for the system? How do we even make a fridge large enough to actually hold a million qubits? And interestingly enough, that is actually even a project we're looking at today. We have a project on the team that's called Superfridge, and we're effectively building a really, really, really large dilution refrigerator that'll give us the cooling capacity and ability to cool down all the components that we might imagine needing at the one million qubit level. And here's a quick picture of how that work is ongoing in our lab today. So really looking ahead, all these different elements for how we scale towards that million qubit front come down to specific quantum hardware challenges. And these quantum hardware challenges really, really um, span across the entire stack from the, at the room temperature level control electronics and scaling up the microwave controls for our systems in a, in a fashion that is also at the same time low noise. Then to inside the refrigerator, deciding how much of that control needs to be actually cold in the fridge, maybe at 4 Kelvin or even at lower temperatures, to increasing the total number of cables that are inside the fridge to bring signals to the processors itself, looking at ideas of cryoflex cables and other types of scalable components or even motherboard architectures that might, uh, that might uh, allow us to have a larger number of qubits inside. And then down to the qubits themselves, continuing to improve the underlying materials that we use to make them so that we can push the envelope in terms of their lifetimes as well as how we couple them so that we can continue to bring down those error rates. So really, the, there are a lot of qu hardware challenges throughout the stack and throughout the, the system that we need to look at moving forward. And then even at that one million qubit level, you might ask, is that even enough? Um, for that matter, we're even looking at other ways of actually having uh, what we call quantum intranet. How can we actually connect multiple quantum systems together via a different quantum degree of freedom? In fact, even potentially transducing the quantum information in the superconducting processor into a quantum degree of freedom on a, on a photon and optically transmitting it and connecting multiple 
quantum processors that way. So this area of quantum in interconnects is actually a really, really exciting and forward-looking avenue of research that the entire field is starting to embark upon, and which we at IBM also see as a critical part to future scalability. Now, laying that foundational bedrock of, of our roadmap with hardware is critical, but we also need to pair it with a developer, software developer ecosystem. Laying that foundation of quantum hardware is, a, is really important as a bedrock over which to have a developer roadmap to drive the ecosystem adoption of the platform and quantum computing in general. It's really critical to look at how do we actually bring more users into the, into the ecosystem and have a really a frictionless uh, path to using quantum computers. Now, a, a big part of this now is, is back to the, the, the picture of, of how do we actually make the, the hardware usable for quantum circuits. Well, uh, it, it comes down to improving quality, as I've mentioned before, but also the, these other elements of capacity and variety. And now a lot of those parts for capacity and variety come down to improvements across the software stack. And so this uh, compelled us earlier this year to release our software development roadmap, where we really wanted to break down the various elements for different types of developers to engage in the ecosystem and actually get value out of the hardware that we're building. From application developers, or we might call them model developers, at the very top of the stack, who are looking to actually use quantum hardware in order to drive uh, solutions and applications in machine learning or optimization or in chemistry. We want to have application modules that they can actually tap into. Um, then you have algorithm developers who might want to know a little more nitty gritty details about the structure of algorithms and how they run on actual quantum hardware. And we would need to make sure that we enable them and give them the right entry points and APIs to use the software stack there. And then there's what we call kernel developers. And these are people who would really want to drive elements of, of uh, increasing capacity of circuits, finding ways to actually have a, have, a, have a stronger tie between the classical and quantum integration so that more circuits can be run, as well as dynamic integration of circuits so that they can run uh, new concepts like, like iterative phase estimation. And so really this development roadmap that we released gave a multi-year view for how different classes of developers could really get engaged and start to use and, and employ the underlying quantum hardware resources that we have. Now all of this is done within our open source framework Qiskit. And this is really uh, 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 a, a project that is now fully in the open source and in the community, driving various elements of the full stack of how, how, how giving touch points for those kernel developers, giving touch points for those algorithm developers and to, to, to build in compilers that are more efficient onto realistic hardware. And then also giving touch points to those application developers who might want a, a chemistry module or a machine learning module. All of that is now being built into our Qiskit framework. What's more is that we are always very interested in finding new ways of expanding our community reach and also broadening the ecosystem. To the point that uh, on our team we had a, this uh, crazy idea from, from one of our, our team members, Lako uh, Minev, who said, what if we were able to actually open source some of the design elements of the superconducting qubit hardware itself? And so er earlier this year we also uh, uh, released what we call Qiskit Metal, which is actually a way of allowing users to, uh, to, to design and simulate actual quantum processors at the, at the, at the chip level and giving yet another open source element into our entire tool set, uh, at a, but at a much lower level, and, and actually touching how to actually build a real quantum processor itself. Overall, this idea of community and education is absolutely fundamental to what we see as being important uh, to driving quantum computing ahead. We have the foundational elements of the hardware, we have the, the open source ecosystem, but on top of that also, we need to have the ability to, to, to reach a large number of learners uh, in order to, um, to, to basically become uh, quantum developers of the future.
Through Qiskit, we host a, 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 an open source textbook for learning, as well as uh, providing uh, various tutorials, as well as, as programs of educational uh, with partners, including with, uh, with um, historically black, black colleges uh, and universities, which we announced late last year. Basically, the educational piece and research piece is absolutely fundamental to how we will progress and how we really push quantum computing forward together. On top of that, it is exciting throughout the world the types of business deals that are already forward-looking and engaging into quantum computing. From working with the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany to working with the University of Tokyo in Japan to most recently announcing a multi-year partnership with the Cleveland Clinic looking at ways of accelerating discovery across both AI and quantum. Now is really the time that quantum computing is driving our future forward and really giving the opportunity to explore ways of having a different form of computation. We're back to that, that first chart of how do we branch, and right now we are living in that branch of moving ahead using quantum computing. So I'm really excited about where we are today, and just to look back, even just in terms of from a hardware perspective of where we were in 2010 uh, is, is the picture on, on, on the, uh, uh, is shown here to where we are today with our Hummingbird processor. A lot has happened in the last, uh, last 10 years of hardware development and certainly in the last 40 years. Uh, and I'm just excited to see what's going, in, going to happen over the next 40 years. Thank you. I'm Dario Gill, I am the director of IBM Research, and I'm here with Jay Gambetta, IBM Fellow and Vice President of Quantum Computing at IBM. Now, the first thing I want to be able to do is I want to thank MIT, IBM Quantum, and the Quiskit community for coming together and organizing QC40. Actually, when we think back about the amount of progress that has transpired in 40 years since that very original conference between MIT and IBM, it is truly remarkable. And while it may be too much to ask Jay to foresee and anticipate what the next 40 years are gonna be like, I definitely can ask him at least, what is the next decade? By the time we roll to QC50, what is the world of quantum computing gonna look like? Yeah, I hope in the next 10 years, we actually get to the point of having a true quantum computer that is actually useful. I think there's gonna be a lot of research by people in the community and around the world, and I'm really looking forward to seeing this happen. I wanna thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the remaining sessions. Hello again, I am back very briefly to just thank you, Jerry, and all of the keynotes throughout the morning, the panelists once again, and to Jay and Dario, of course, for their closing remarks and for being here with us today to celebrate QC40. I also just wanted to make sure to come back to thank all of the organizers and the videographers for their tremendous effort in this event. Specifically, I wanted to make sure we give a huge thanks to Josine and Maureen, uh, Callie Ferguson, Susie Krishner, Laron Gill, Paul Cyril, David Rodriguez, Clinton Herrick, Abe Aswa, Liz Durst, and the entire Kiska team. Thank you all so much for your effort. I also wanted to quickly direct everybody's attention to the afternoon session. The educational fund will continue just on a different platform. And I know over 1,500 of you have already registered, but if you haven't yet, it's not a problem. There is a link in the description below to register just for the afternoon session. Just fill out a quick form, it should only take a minute. We have a lot more great content from students and researchers in the field who are going to discuss recent key results. We will have two parallel sessions in theory and software and on experimental and hardware research, both of which are going to be kicked off by Sarah Sheldon at IBM and Aram Harrow of MIT, with talks of their own summarizing recent key discoveries and where they fit into the field's long-term goals. So thank you again for joining us today. This was really a lot of fun, and I hope to see you all in the afternoon session beginning at 1.30.